be recording the lectures on here for video. I upload stuff on YouTube, so um, so you guys know for, for your information. Anyways, it's uh, it's nice to be here with you guys this week. I'm excited to be able to go through the Book of Romans and to help us to understand uh, this simple book, like Chance said. Uh, as you guys have read through Romans uh, already at least twice, right? Finished PTs. Are you guys on the structure right now? Finished it up. Um, so you've read it about three times or so. Uh, you have now found out that the Book of Romans uh, is a very dense book. <laughs> it's uh, It's that almost every verse could have a sermon preached on it. Uh, there's so much in this book, and so I'm hoping that we can talk about a lot of it and really understand it well, and hopefully to open up the book for us over the next few days so that you guys uh, can understand it and dive into it. Now, to introduce a little bit of myself, you guys know my family, but some helpful other pictures than just us in the past couple hours. Um, Alexander loves soccer. Um, uh, Meech and I, a couple we talked last night, but uh, Meech and I have been married about seven years, uh, seven and a half now, uh, and Alexander is going to be five in December. Uh, we have been working with YWAM our whole marriage. Uh, I have been working with YWAM since 2009 and Meech since 2014, full-time as staff, and then 2016 we got married, and we have uh, worked with SBS in Europe and in the States, and have been most recently leading the SBS in Kona, as Chancellor. So that's really what we have been doing. Um, I did my SBS, or did my DTS in Kona, 2009, and Miji in Sweden in 2011, and then I did SBS in uh, Taiwan, 2013, and Miji did it in Cambridge in 2017. So that's a, a little bit of us, and you guys know us a little bit more as we spend some days together. But I'd love to hear from you guys a little bit uh, from, from about your name, where you're from, and then uh, where you did DTS. And then one other question. Why, why are you doing BCC? Oh, you can start up here. All right. Uh, my name is Austin. I'm from Dallas, Texas. And I did my DTS in the Dominican Republic in San Diego. And I'm doing BCC because I was challenged by the Lord. Um, just with my heart for evangelism to the nation of Peru, I kind of have heard, like, I want people to know God the way I know God. So that brought on the question of how well do I really know God? Mm -hmm. And it would be maybe not too good to be like, I want them to know God like the way I do if I myself really don't know God. And so God brought me here to take this course to put me to understand Him better back to YWAM's uh, mission to know God and to make him known. And knowing God from so far making him known. So I just felt challenged to dig into the word a little more. Amen. Um, Amen. That's a good why. My name's Joshua. I'm from Sousa, Kentucky. I did my DTS in Wild Montana Lakeside. Um, and I am doing the BCC because my sister's on staff here. So she said, hey, come do the BCC. Um, so I was like, sure, why not? I think since I've been here, kind of like my motivation has changed because um, I think it truly does transform our lives. And so so uh, that's like my current why, but my initial why was my sister told me to. Amen. Amen. The yes. Lord can use so many different ways. Yes. My name is Ma, and I'm from Sweden. Uh, and I did my DTS here in the, uh, this uh, generation. Um, and I want to do the BCC because um, when I did my outreach for the BCC, I would put the Bible in my heart and mm -hmm. it opened up my eyes for the Bible. And I was like, no, this is it. <laughs> so Amen. I just uh, wanted to learn more how to apply the Word on my life and did my 
That's great, guys. And it sounds like the January DTS was a good DTS. Got a lot of people coming back. So uh, that's so great to hear your guys' why uh, behind it. It's really important to keep that kind of on the forefront of our mind as we go through into school. Um, it helps to keep us in a place of motivation. And uh, with four weeks left, remembering why you're doing the school is really important. Now, of course, each one of us has a why in doing uh, the BCC and studying the scripture. Uh, but there is, there's really a big why of, for God, of why he brings uh, any one of us. This is, this is maybe not the right pen to use. Do I need, do I need to use the spray? Yeah, the spray is fine. Okay, great. Good to know. Should I use a different pen? Or is this pen fine? That's the only one that really works. Okay. <laughs> then I will not write so central. <laughs> Be more considerate of where I'm writing things. Okay, so in, in coming to study the Bible and really getting a good foundation in Scripture, the Lord has us doing this really because of what Jesus gives to his disciples at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, the Great Commission. And we're going to come back here to look at this. I know you guys did Matthew a couple weeks ago, but we're going to take a look at this passage. So let's open up to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And it is so important that you guys are spending time to study the Bible at this time in your life because the rates of biblical illiteracy amongst the body of Christ are really staggering. Globally, not just in America, but across the world, uh, people's understanding of the scripture is very minimal. Uh, if you survey the average Christian, what you'll find is that they will read the entire Bible one time in their lifetime. Right. If you ask how many read the Bible two times or more in their lifetime, what you'll find is it drops below 10%. Three times or more drops below 5%, and then four times or more is less than 0.1% Christians. Right. It is, is very minimal right, of uh, that Christians will engage with the scripture. And this is so important for us to know the scripture and for us to understand it because of what Jesus instructs us in the Great Commission. So would somebody read out Matthew 28, 18 through 20 for us. And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. So, in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, we get what seems to be a few commands. So, what are the commands that Jesus gives in this passage? Or the instructions, I should say. Okay, I heard somebody say, go, make disciples. Good. So, make disciples of all nations. Great. Okay, baptize. To do it in the name of Good, so the baptism is in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What is the last instruction? Teach. Teach. Okay, great. So we've got these four instructions here that Jesus gives to his disciples at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, only one of these is actually a command in the Greek. Uh, an imperative form tells us a word is a command for somebody to go and do something. Right Now, each one of these is an instruction, but only make disciples is actually a command in the text, okay? Go is in the present participle, meaning that wherever you go, however you go, whenever you go, wherever you go, right, this is what you're supposed to do, is to make disciples. Now, this is a really important question a lot of people consider in Christianity. How do you make a disciple? How do you disciple people? What does it look like to be a disciple of Christ? And what Jesus does for us is give us exactly how to make a disciple, right? The first step is baptism. Right? That's the first thing he says of making a disciple is to baptize them. And that baptism, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, is the process of commitment of one's life to Christ. Right? Nobody gets baptized unless they have given their life to Jesus. Right? Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to get baptized. It's an outward declaration of the inward decision to follow Jesus. So this is the evangelism portion, but oftentimes it gets stuck here, and people assume that they've made a disciple when someone has committed themselves to Christ. All, right. All that means is that someone has made a confession of commitment to Christ, not becoming a disciple of Christ, right? To disciple somebody, making a disciple is a follow-through of teaching, right? But we can sometimes get caught in the, I think, uh, deception a little bit that if we just feed people information, that we are making a disciple, right? But Jesus doesn't say to just educate people. 
right? What does he say in the scripture? Teach to observe. Now, this isn't observe as in BCC observations, right? Teach people to be good BCC students in the scripture, right? No, observe is the word tereo. The word tereo in Greek means to obey or to keep, to observe in the sense of doing something, okay? So what Jesus says is teach people to obey what? What is, what is we supposed to teach them to obey? What he has commanded, right? We teach them to observe what he has commanded. And when we teach people to observe what he has commanded, this is, the, this is so significant for any Christian who is seeking to obey Jesus. Because if you don't know what he's commanded, then what ends up happening is you make your disciple in the image of your teacher, or your pastor, or your small group leader. Whatever speaker you've had in DTS that has said something nice that you go and you tell somebody else when you're out on outreach, share the gospel with them, and you just pass on what you heard someone say from the front of the room. And what you're doing is you're making a disciple in the image of that person rather than in the image of Christ. Right? If we don't know what he's commanded, then we just follow other people right? rather than Jesus. This is so essential for us to know the scripture so that we can obey Jesus well and correctly to make disciples the way Jesus asked us to. Right? And when so few people know what the scriptures say, they end up replicating a teacher or replicating some book they've read, instead of actually replicating what they read in the scripture. It's so important for us, you guys, to understand the Bible so we can do what Jesus asks us to do correctly. And so as you are here and gaining um, your understanding of scripture, knowing God and knowing what he has said, it is for the purpose of making disciples. Jesus doesn't say just go out and get people saved. Right? That's the beginning step. Right? He says go and make disciples, which means to teach them how to follow Jesus according to scripture. So it's very important that as we are going through uh, the, next, the next few days, but then for you guys the next few weeks, that your sights are on and thinking about the people that God is going to bring you to the rest of your life. When I did SBS, it was one of the things on my mind, and I, it's still on my mind as I study and as I research, and all that I do is the people God is bringing me to, the people he's going to send me to, to be able to share with them about the scripture to give away what I have received. And if I do a poor job or I slack on it, then they are going to be deprived because I could have given them something uh, that I had failed to gain myself simply because I was lazy or whatever it may be. So I think for us over the next few weeks, you guys, um, it is so important to lay hold of the reality that God will bring us to people to give away what we have received. Because the reality is, is you are only going to keep what you give away. After the BCC, um, you'll, be, you'll finish with a ton of understanding, a ton of knowledge of scripture, but you'll only keep what you give away to other people. In five or 10 years from now, if you haven't shared with people what you are learning during these past three months, you will lose it. You'll forget it. It won't be um, inside of you anymore. You'll come to scripture and be like, I remember this one teaching about this one thing, and I, I just wish I could remember what it was. If you give things away, it will grow permanently in your heart, and you will not forget it. It is so important to find people to share with, to give away to what you are learning in this school. Uh, and that is in obedience to what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 28. So <clears throat> don't waste any time. <laughs> God, God will bring you to people who will need what you have received. Now, as we think about the book of Romans and we look at bringing the gospel to people, what we are uh, what I want us to begin thinking about is, is there, is there anybody that, that we may think is not deserving of the gospel? Is there anybody that we may think uh, is less deserving or is less a priority for us or we feel doesn't deserve to hear the good news of Jesus? Maybe they have done, committed some atrocity. Maybe they have done something for which we feel they might deserve what they are receiving or what they will receive if they don't hear the gospel. Uh, the book of Romans is essentially about racial division. What is really important for us in coming to the book of Romans, and, uh, and really in any book, as you guys have been learning, is to know the historical context. You've got to know what is going on. What's the situation that the readers are in that the author is writing into? And the book of Romans is no different. Even though this book is such, it seems like such a dense theological treat, 
right? It almost is just like a presentation of Paul's gospel. And you read this, you're like, hey, this is the Christian faith. This is what I'm supposed to believe. Paul is not just writing into a vacuum where he's writing some theological book to put on your shelf. He's writing into a situation that the Roman church is facing. Something is going on between members of the church. And what Paul is doing is he is writing this book into that situation to resolve the differences. And what seems to be the case, and we'll talk about how this plays out in the letter, is that what Paul is dealing with in the book of Romans is racial dissension. The Jews and the Gentiles are splitting away from one another, separating from each other because of racial differences. We'll see how, how that will play out. But it is important for us to keep this in mind as we go, that whether there are areas in our own life where we have separated from people, where we hold certain prejudices against people because of their ethnic heritage, or because of their cultural heritage, or because of their cultural background, that we might withhold or refrain or hesitate from bringing the gospel to them because of where they are from or who they are. Uh, this is really important for us, you guys, to consider because what we see with Paul in this letter is that he doesn't allow any distinctions to keep him from who he brings the gospel to. Right, whether that is Greek or barbarian, wise or foolish, which we'll talk about those designations uh, this morning, that Paul finds all people worthy of receiving the gospel. Did you guys catch where Paul is anticipating going to at the end of this letter? Chapter 15, to Spain, great. So Paul is anticipating going to Spain, right? Now, for him, that is the whole length of the Mediterranean. I mean, this is only half the Mediterranean. Spain, way over here, right? Paul's anticipation is to go to the furthest extents of the Roman Empire to bring the gospel, right? He's thinking about people who have not heard it, regardless of how different they are from him. Do you guys remember the book of Jonah? You guys started with Jonah, right? Way back at the beginning of BCC. Where was Jonah trying to go in the book of Jonah. Tarshish, good. Tarshish, as well as we know, is in modern day Spain. And so it is a amazing contrast, you see with Jonah trying to flee away from bringing people the good news of God, the repentant message of Yahweh, and he fleeing to Spain to run away from this. Instead, what you have now is Paul running to Spain to try to bring the gospel to people, this repentant message from God to invite people into the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And we see Paul's desire, his ambition is to make Jesus known where he is not. And when he looks at the church of Rome and he sees what they are facing, the issues that they're going through, we'll, we'll unfold those a little bit historically here in just a little bit. When he sees these things, he says it is not right for the church to be dividing over these issues. Right? There must be reconciliation. There must be a renewal of what God has done. I mean, he has broken down a dividing wall of hostility to create in himself one new man, right? Ephesians chapter 3, or chapter 2, sorry. So it is so important for us, you guys, that as we look at this book, we put it inside its historical context, and I think a lot of the things that tend to be very theologically difficult in this book will help to find some more grounding inside of a historical context, right? Which is often what we find in the books anyways, right? When you read 1 Corinthians, and last week, there were so many questions, so much confusion, probably when you read it the first time. And then once you get some historical context, you're like, oh, it's pretty easy, you know, very straightforward. I think in Romans is a similar situation. A lot of things that tend to be very dense find some good grounding in the historical background. So that's what we're going to look at as we go through the book of Romans. We're going to unfold this and walk through um, probably the first two chapters today. Tomorrow, we're going to try to get chapter 3 through chapter 8 or 9, and then we'll go from 9 uh, to the end of the book. Thursday. Okay, so that's a bit of our roadmap of where we're going to go over the next few days, and we'll try to stick with that as best as we can. Uh, but as we get started here, before we start looking at the BRI, what questions have you guys had uh, from the Book of Romans? As you've read through it a few times now, what are some of the questions that you guys have? we put these on the board so we can make sure that we cover them over the next few days. Start. Yeah, Joshua. Um, 
this many times. Why does he say to the Jew first and to the Gentile? Mm. And then can I ask like a, a second question off of that? Um, I was reading last night, um, mm -hmm. and you just like forgot titles. And it's talking about this idea of like Israel had to stumble first mm. so that the Gentiles could receive the good news. Sure. Is that, like, yes, is that correct? Yeah, do you have the passage reference in that? It's probably in uh, chapter 9 or 11. Yeah, I'm in 11. Um, 11, 11. So I said that they stumble in order that they might fall ra by no means rather that their trespass, that through their trespass, all their trespass comes to the Gentiles. Um, so I said they real jealous. Mm. And so it's just like, that I guess it kind of goes back to like the Jews first and to the Gentiles. Yeah. Like yeah. Well, definitely. We'll, we'll get to these ones. Yes. And yeah. also in chapter 9, is, uh -huh. I, have, I think it has something similar to that right now as well. Potter and the clay bit or something of the same matter? Of, of the same matter of the okay. Jews first then with the stumbling. Okay. Somebody else? Any other questions? You guys have had in the book. Yeah, Joe. Okay, 12, 1, and 2. So you're not ready to be a sacrifice? I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. In line uh, 14, no, 15, it says, I have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I have, I have had compassion on whom I have mercy. Mm. Like, what is that? Yeah. to that for sure. Yeah. Uh, in Romans 2, it talks about how the Gentiles have the law on their heart. And there's another place, I can't remember where it is, it's in Peter or something in the New Testament, where um, it talks about how the Gentiles are not held to the same law that the Jews are. But it seems like Paul is alluding to that even though they don't have the law, they subject themselves to it by acting according to it. And so I was wondering, how do you navigate that? Yeah. Okay, so I'm sure some more will spark as we go along. So please, always feel free to ask questions as we go through. Uh, there's always room for us to continue to chat and to look at specifics in the text or anything that I might skip over or something like that, which hopefully won't be too much in this book. So let's talk about the background information. We're going to look at the authorship of this letter. Uh, we'll look at some of the, the, basically the critical information, then we'll talk about the purpose, and then we'll talk about the literature of this book and how to understand it better. So the book of Romans is the least contested of all of Paul's letters. It is the strongest external backing and is fits into a category of what is considered to be the undisputed epistles. No one has really ever tried to argue that Paul didn't write the book of Romans. And so we won't spend a lot of time trying to evidence that he did write the book of Romans because no one disagrees with it. One of the um, reasons is, is because of the similarities of topicality between Galatians and 1 Corinthians, which we specifically find with things like justification by faith. That is deemed one of the key concepts of Paul and in the books that carry this concept, the, they are deemed undisputed. So Galatians, 1 Corinthians are two of those, and 1 Thessalonians. Really, the other ones begin to be disputed uh, a few hundred years ago, really, when the age of criticism begins to rise up. So um, Romans is, fits into this unique category, but it's then helpful to look at what are some of the things we know about Paul from the book of Romans. 
Uh, what does he express about himself in this book that help us to understand why he's writing it and what's on his heart? Well, we see that for a long time he has desired to travel to Rome. This is a key aspect of him writing to these people. Right? For sure he's heard about the church in Rome. Um, he knows about the church there. He's uh, met Priscilla and Aquila on his second missionary journey in the early 50s in Corinth while he was there for 18 months. And they had come from Rome. So he has been well aware of the church in Rome and the Christians there and how they have followed Jesus. And so for a long time, he has desired to come there. Like he says, not necessarily to bring them the gospel, but so that he might use Rome as a sending base for the Western Mediterranean so that he might jump off from there. We also see that uh, from chapter 15, he's desired to use it as a sending base for this for his ministry in Spain, specifically as he heads to reach there. And at this time right now, we know that Paul is headed to Jerusalem. So in Acts chapter 20, uh, 19, 20, he's heading back towards Jerusalem with a collection. And this is donations for the poor in Jerusalem. Paul mentions this in chapter 15 of Romans. This is right at the end of his third missionary journey when he's writing the book of Romans. And so we'll talk about date just a little bit. But he is on his way to Jerusalem to bring a collection that he has gathered from the Gentile churches around the Aegean Sea. So in this region. And he is bringing that on to Jerusalem. Now what you find very interesting in the end of the book of Romans is Paul's attitude. Right? Chapter 15, you find Paul's attitude, which is very different from what happens in Acts. You guys remember what happens in Acts? Right? Paul gets to Jerusalem, there's this riot that happens, and he's in prison for two years in Caesarea, and then he gets transported to Rome, he's in prison for two more years. In Romans 15, Paul is like, I'm so excited to bring the money to Jerusalem, and then I'm going to come to you as quick as I can. And so you see, Paul doesn't anticipate the four-year imprisonment he's about to have. Right? He doesn't know like the riot that's going to take place. So it's interesting, you get kind of his attitude towards the events uh, of his present situation, what he's anticipating, and we get to know exactly what happens to him. So it's just an interesting dynamic. So let me just keep that in mind when you look at Paul. But so he's bringing this collection, and he fears some persecution potentially from the Jews, but he doesn't anticipate there to be this huge riot that ends up taking place. Now, although he hasn't been to Rome, and he doesn't know all of the believers personally, we do find that he is confident in their ability to know what he's talking about. In 1515, he says, On some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Verse 14, sorry, where he starts, he says, I myself am satisfi satisfied about you, my brothers, that... You yourselves are full of goodness and filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. So Paul kind of expresses his confidence in their ability to understand what he's saying and to internalize it and then to communicate it to one another. So Paul's confident in the church, their ability to reconcile what God has done inside of them. So he's not too worried about that. Now, when we get Paul as well, uh, as a person, we know a lot about him. I'm sure you guys can tell me tons. And so we know he's educated the feet of Gamaliel, the most significant Jewish rabbi alive at the time. Uh, and he is kind of personally tutored by Gamaliel. You see that he sit, sits at his feet. Uh, we know Paul is also raised in Tarsus as a young man and then also goes back to work there for nearly a decade after he's sent away from Jerusalem in Acts chapter 9, end of chapter 9. Uh, <clears throat> so... Him being raised in Tarsus as a Jew, Tarsus was the leading Greek educational center next to Alexandria as the primary one. So Paul would have been exposed to a lot of Greek ideas, would have been raised thoroughly Jewish, and so his relationship to reach out to Jews and Gentiles was supreme. It is very clear why Jesus called him on the road to Damascus because of his personal history in Tarsus and as a Jew. As well, we know that he is a Roman citizen, which awards him certain privileges, but also a unique status in the Roman Empire that was not given to anybody and everybody. So Paul has this very unique situation, and in his ability to be able to write to reconcile both Jews and Gentiles, he makes him the perfect author to speak into the racial division that is going on in the city of Rome. <clears throat> 
Now, when is Paul writing the letter to the Romans? There are some key things that help us to know where Paul is, and because we know where he is, we can know when it is. And so in 16.1, we see that Paul is going to send Phoebe from Cancrea, and Cancrea is the sister port to Corinth. So it's kind of, it's not on this map, but Cancrea is on the Aegean side of this isthmus. You guys learned about the isthmus, right? In 1 Corinthians, they would take the cargo out and roll it across the land, or even the boats sometimes. That isthmus had Corinth on one side and King Crea on the other side. Phoebe is a deaconess at King Crea, and Paul is sending her with the letter. So Paul is for sure in this vicinity, King Crea or Corinth at the time. They're only a couple miles apart from each other, so it's easy to walk there on a, in one uh, part of the day, I mean, before lunchtime or something like that. So Paul is taking the collection to Jerusalem, which we know he was doing in Acts chapter 20, right at the beginning of the chapter. And so this places him very clearly on his third missionary journey. We also see Gaius mentioned uh, in chapter 16, verse 23, who's mentioned at the beginning of the book of 1 Corinthians, Erastus, who we know was a, uh, who was a city treasurer in Corinth, and he's mentioned as the city treasurer in the book of Romans, here in chapter 16, verse 23. And what really fits well is that Paul is writing this letter in at, at, at this specific verse reference, Acts chapter 20, verse 3. It says he spent three months in Corinth. And this is probably when he's writing the letters to the Romans. This is would be then during the end of his third missionary journey, I think placing it very well around 56 to 57 AD. Now, do you guys, did you guys talk about 2 Corinthians a little bit at all? Okay, so 1 Corinthians ends, like you, you finish 1 Corinthians and it seems like, oh great, it's a letter that gets sent, everything seems hunky-dory, right? Paul sends a letter and everything's good, right? But what you find out when you get to 2 Corinthians is that Paul's letter was not received well it prompts a very, um, a very emotional visit where Paul is upset. Uh, it is called, uh, it, it is this very emotionally heated meeting he has with the Corinthians in light of 1 Corinthians. He leaves on a bad note, and then he writes a very emotional letter to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it his tearful letter. After he writes that letter, there's another correspondence, and then Paul leaves Ephesus at, in act, end of Acts chapter 19, after the riot, he's leaving Ephesus, and while he's on his way, he begins to write 2 Corinthians, or, or he sends Titus on to Corinth to prepare the Corinthians for his arrival. Well, Titus brings back a report to Paul while he's still in Macedonia. And he says, there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the Corinthians, way worse than it was before. And so Paul writes 2 Corinthians ahead of his visit. He, he stops probably in Philippi or Thessalonica, writes the book of 2 Corinthians uh, with his buddies, sends it probably with Titus to Corinth in preparation for his arrival. And the letter of 2 Corinthians is all about reconciliation. Paul is trying to reconcile his relationship with the Corinthians and also to show them that the value system they have more reflects the world than it does Christianity, right? More the world than Jesus, which is a lot of what he's doing in 1 Corinthians anyways, but the case has gotten much more severe. Paul comes to Corinth and it seems like everything gets resolved while Paul is in Corinth. He spends three months there with these guys and it's at this time that he reconciles with the Corinthians, makes the collection, and brings some represent, representatives from Corinth with him and, that are listed at the beginning of Acts chapter 20. And this group goes on to Jerusalem to bring the collection. What is significant about this moment in time that Paul writes the book of Romans is that he has just finished an incredibly significant reconciliation moment with a church that he has planted. And the book of Romans is all about reconciliation. And so he seems to be writing from a lot of personal experience with these churches, right? Having just reconciled the Corinthians, he's now writing to the Romans. Now, when Paul is writing to the Romans, this is Paul's longest letter. It is one of his most theologically intricate letters 
and it is very significant in the way that it is composed. We'll talk about the literature here in just a little bit. But the letter that Paul writes to the Romans is a letter that would have taken time. Okay? Sometimes we have this impression that letters were written quickly. Did you guys talk about the composition of letters last week, 1 Corinthians? Okay, great. So you know then that the letter, of Rome, the letter to the Romans was probably written and composed over the course of a few months. So the whole time Paul is there, he's probably writing the letter to the Romans, putting this thing together, hashing it out, reviewing it, revising it, editing it, talking with his friends. And so it would have taken a few months to put this letter together and prepare it to be sent. And so I think Paul probably sends the letter with Phoebe around the same time when he leaves Corinth at the end of his third missionary journey heading back to Jerusalem. The Erastus, you guys may have talked about him last week in 1 Corinthians, um, the city treasure that's listed in Romans 16, 23. This is the original inscription. Um, it's, it's there in Corinth right now. This is a reconstruction of it, uh, just with a digital image. So this is the third missionary journey. Paul and his buddies travel inland to Ephesus and then onward to Corinth. And it's around this time he writes 2 Corinthians. There's all this resolution that happens while he's in Corinth, and then he heads out uh, from Corinth back through the provinces of Macedonia onto Miletus, where then he sails on to Jerusalem from there. <laughs> And then, of course, we know his journey from Caesarea, where he will then travel to Rome at the end of the book of Acts. So let's talk about the readers in Rome. Who are these people? What's going on in the church? What do we know about them? And how can we understand this situation? One of the helpful perspectives when we come to the book of Romans uh, is to read it backwards. We don't start with the beginning to know about the readers. We start with the end. Chapters 14 and chapter 16 are two of the most helpful chapters for understanding what the church is going through. What is their baseline issue that Paul is writing into and trying to resolve? And what he will use is all of this theological material from the first half of the letter, right, all the way pretty much up until chapter 12, is going to bolster what he's asking the church to do in chapter 14. And so really from reading chapter 16 and chapter 14, we can understand what the church is going through, who these people are, and how they are divided. So what we find in chapter 16 is a list of names, right? A ton of names. There's 26 in total, which is the longest list of names that Paul writes in any one of his letters. Now, the interesting thing about that is that this is a church Paul has never visited before. Right? Wouldn't you expect him to write a long list of names to the churches he's visited? like Galatians or Ephesians, Thessalonians, saying hi to all of his friends, saying hi to all the people he misses so much. But in fact, it's Romans and Colossians, two churches that he has never visited before that have the longest list of greetings. And I think that is very telling of the fact that Paul is relational, right? He's not just saying, you know, I'm just some super high up guy who has the authority to speak into your church situation and your lives. But these people can vouch for me, right? These people know how I minister, they know who I am, and they know why this letter should be received. And so he lists all of these people as kind of a support system for why the letter should be received. So you, could you imagine, you know, somebody writing a letter to this base, a, a prominent church leader? You know, let's take someone like Francis Chan writing a letter to the Honolulu base. You're like, hey, it's important because it's Francis Chan, but... Why should we even care? He's never been here before. He doesn't really know us, right? But if there's people who can vouch for him, like, no, I know Francis. He has a really good heart. He, he really cares about you guys here. It would be received a lot better, right? So Paul includes a lot of people that he knows. Now, what we see then from this list is the way that it's organized grammatically in Greek is that there are probably about five to seven house churches in the city of Rome. And these house churches seem to be organized ethnically, whether Gentile or Jewish. And this is an issue for Paul. This list of names is also quite diverse. We have a lot of people listed, 
26 by name, as I mentioned. There's men and women listed by names. We have people who are freeborn and people who are slaves. And you might ask, why do we know they're slaves? Or how do we know they're slaves? Well, because of their names. Trifema and Trifosa mean three and four. And no parent names their child third and fourth with good heart, right? That's what you name your slaves. Okay. So um, the third and the fourth uh, are classic slave names in the first century. So we do know there are people who are freeborn and people who are slaves. And what Paul will do then throughout this letter is address both groups individually, the, the Jews and the Gentiles. So this is quite significant for us. Now, he will address these groups in a variety of different passages. A, a lot of the time, he'll address both of them together, but there will be many times where they are individually addressed. Chapter 7 is a significant one, where Paul has just talked really about the Gentile situation in chapter 6, and then he will transition to the Jewish situation in chapter 7. And we'll look at how that plays out. <clears throat> And what Paul is trying to do throughout this letter is not to split the groups up, but to unite them together, to show that they are both in the same situation, they're both on the same playing field, and one is not better than the other, which tends to be the kind of backbone for all racial division, is that one ethnic group thinks that they are better than the other group. And what Paul is going to show throughout this letter is that one is not better than the other, that you both need Jesus. And we'll expound on that a lot in the first part of this letter. Now, the issues that they seem to be dividing over are which, primarily, really, which days to meet on. Do you meet on Saturday or do you meet on Sunday? Right? In chapter 14, verse 1, we see that some people consider one day better than another. You're quarreling over opinions. Uh, verse 2, sorry, the verse 1 is about quarreling over opinions. Verse 2 is about whether they eat. What days, or what things do they eat? And then verse 5, what do they meet? Where do they meet? Or when do they meet? What days of the week should they be meeting on? And these are, are really Jew-Gentile issues. For the Jews, they're, of course, established in this place of viewing the Sabbath as the important day to meet on. That's when you come together for synagogue, and that is Saturday morning. You meet together on Saturday for Sabbath. And then the Gentiles have changed it. What is most convenient for them? Right, now the Gentiles are meeting on a different day. Right? For the Jews, they don't eat any pork. They don't eat shellfish. There's a number of other things they don't eat. But pig is the most common meat in the first century. Did you guys talk about this last week in 1 Corinthians? No? Okay. So pig is the most common available meat in the first century. Do you guys know why? Because the gestation period for piglets is very short. And when a pig has piglets... They have a litter of pigs. A lamb has one, or a sheep has one lamb. A cow has one calf. Okay. They only produce one animal at a time, where a pig can have as many as 10 piglets come out at once. And they can bear as many as three litters a year. Okay. So you've got 30 piglets from one pig. And those the, the period it takes for that pig to grow is a matter of months rather than a cow, which would take years to get to full size, or a lamb, which will take about a year and a half to get to full size, where it is uh, really viable for production of wool and meat and all of that. Okay. So, pigs are widely eaten by everybody simply because of convenience, and uh, it's inexpensive. <laughs> so, that's why Gentiles eat pigs. Okay. Jews don't, of course, we know that very well. And so they're dividing over what they can eat. So they come together for love feast, uh, which they would do on a weekly basis. And as they come together for that love feast, all the Gentiles are cooking up a nice sheet of bacon for everybody to eat and share, right? It's a good pork belly and great pork chops. And the Jews are super offended by this. And what Paul then is doing is trying to reconcile them over the food that they eat. Right? So these are really the issues that are dividing the church. And what what is happening then is that Paul is going to put them both on the same playing field and show them that the issues they're dividing over are really non-issues, but that they should value one another over the issue itself. And we'll talk about how that plays out. Now, what we don't want to do is come from a Gentile perspective, assuming that 
the Jews are wrong. Because the Jews just are coming from just the same perspective, saying Gentiles are wrong. Okay? With just as equal justification in their eyes. So we don't want to take one side or the other in this. We want to see how Paul resolves the conflict. What does he do to bring resolution into such a, uh, such a divisive issue for these two people groups? Where the Jews are saying, you know, the Messiah is from the Jews. We should be meeting on Saturdays. We should be not eating these certain things that have been abstained from all of our history. And then even with the Jerusalem Council in chapter 15, it's like, don't eat pork. Great, there it is. Yeah. Don't, don't eat blood, right? Save from sexual morality, right? The, these, those significant things of uh, saving from sexual immorality, not eating blood, um, key things that are saying, you know, let's, let's not uh, do these things. Jews are like, hey, please don't, please don't, right? But Paul is going to resolve these things, I think, very uh, subtly and really call them out in chapter 14 to live a higher life. Ellen, did you have a question? My question was with chapter. Okay. So like you got that? Okay. Yeah. Great. So, so those are the real issues here. Now let's look at the divide of Jew and Gentile. How, how did this come about? What do they think of one another? Um, and what is their past history? Because this doesn't just show up now that they're Christians, but what has been their history ethnic, in their ethnic division? Because Jews and Gentiles have always been divided from one another. Okay, so the categories, Jew and Gentile, is strictly Jews are those who are descended from the tribe of it or tribes of Israel. Okay, in the, down into the first century period, anybody from Judea was referred to as Jewish, or those who are worshiping Yahweh at the temple are Jews. And so anybody who is not a Jew is automatically a Gentile. So the Jews felt uh, a lot of contempt for those who were not Jewish, looked down upon them. The Jews looked at, upon themselves as higher than or better than and lifted themselves up. Anybody who was not a Jew was unclean simply because they ate pork, they ate consumed blood, or they participated in a lot of the, the rituals that would have made someone unclean, um, sexual immorality in the worship of their gods, things like that. The Jews would mock Gentiles for worshiping so many gods right? and having gods for every different thing and having to have idols that were powerless. And obviously that comes a lot from the Old Testament where there are so many instances of mocking the nations for their worship of, of idols that can do nothing. The Jews uh, called Gentiles dogs, foolish children. They called them blind and in darkness because they did not have the law. So there was a lot of derogatory terms thrown around by Jews towards Gentiles. And there's even recorded prayers, which you guys may have heard, where Jewish rabbis pray and thank God that they were not born a Gentile and not born a woman. The Jews, Jews some Jewish rabbis, even went to the extent to teach that if you find a Gentile woman in labor who is, who is in the state of mortal danger, Right? She is, she's going to die, uh, she's bleeding out, something like that. You should not help her deliver the baby because you are bringing another Gentile into the world. The Jews also taught that uh, Jewish, Jews in general should not enter the homes of Gentiles. And the reason is, is because of uh, blood in the home. Right? You don't know if a person in the home, a woman in the home, has had an abortion inside of her home or if she has miscarried a child in the home, or whatever it might be, that there is blood in the home, and simply entering or crossing the threshold would make a Jew unclean. So Gentiles or Jews in general looked down on Gentiles for many different things. But the Gentiles also looked down upon the Jews. It wasn't just one direction. Um, Josh? Back to the thing about what you're saying, that the Jews would enter Gentiles' homes. Yes. Whenever Peter goes to visit Cornelius, and he has the vision, Yeah. I, I taught all that, and so I was like, and whenever Peter makes claims like you know that it's a law that I can't go into mm. your home, there's not an act. What I, what I found is that there was an actual law. It's kind of just like a cultural thing. Yeah. And one interpretation was it said it was like you just don't do it. Mm -hmm. just like like you just know that people don't do that. Yeah. So that's kind of what like the whole Jewish perspective of was like you just don't go into people's homes. Yeah. So culturally, it's like about a thing to do. Right. Yeah, so for the Jews, uh, they, the thing is they always had a reason for why they're doing what they're doing. So uh, 
Peter coming to the home, he says, you know, you, I'm not supposed to be here, and you know that, right? Because Cornelius, for one, is a God-fearer. Uh, and so he knows the Jewish protocol. Right? And their, the rabbinic explanation was because of things like miscarriage or abortion in the home. Uh, that you don't know what has been done in the home. So, yeah. But it, was, it wasn't a law in the Old Testament. It's a, from the oral tradition. It's a cult cultural thing of like, he's... Yes. Yeah, cultural thing, but they had a reason for it. It wasn't just for no reason, but that because of uncleanliness, it would make them unclean to go into their home. Yeah. Which isn't necessarily a sin, as you guys know, right? Being unclean is not a sin. It just means you can't come to the temple or enter into the synagogue. So. Okay. So. Let's talk about the Gentile attitude towards the Jews. So, in the Greco-Roman world, the epitome of human beauty was the male genitals. They viewed the, um, the male genitals as the, the pinnacle of what it meant to be a human, right? The most beautiful part of the human body. And so, for them, circumcision was a mutilization of the most beautiful part of the human body. And the Gentiles would mock Jews for this. They would laugh at them and deride them. Now, in our cultures today, um, being naked around other people tends to be a little bit of a faux pas. Uh, but if you go places like um, in the Nordic countries where there is sauna, being naked around other people is not unusual. Or if you go to bathhouses in Asia and Korea or Japan, um, it is not unusual to be naked around other people. It's the same thing in the first century. Bathhouses where it was segregated men and women, um, it was very common for them to all be naked around each other in there. So it's not like people wouldn't know, like, oh, if you've cut your hair a certain way, then you wouldn't tell if they're Jewish. No, you would know as soon as you go in the bathhouse who's Jewish and who's not. And so they laughed at them laughed at them for uh, this reason, for circumcising this most beautiful part of the body. They as well laughed at them for the food laws because Jews would end up, unless they didn't have a kosher butcher in the town, would end up being vegetarians because they would not eat pig, even though it was the least expensive meat to consume and the most widely available. They laughed at them for the Sabbath because they called Jews lazy. And now for us, we have a two-day weekend, usually. I don't know what your schedule is in BCC. My students work on Saturdays. But uh, most of the working world in the West has a two-day weekend, right? Saturday and Sunday, or at least two days off a week. If you go back a few hundred years, people are going to look at you as lazy. Because only lazy people take a day off. And everybody works seven days a week. The only times you take days off are for religious festivals or holidays. Okay. This is the same way it is in a lot of Asia, even today. Uh, in my SBS in Taiwan, I went to a breakfast shop every day and had the most delicious egg wrap breakfast. And thank God, they worked every single day of my SBS except one day where a family member died and they went to the funeral. Now, that is not a great model, right? That leads to uh, burnout, exhaustion, um, despairing of life, all those types of things. Uh, but if you if you take a day off every week or even two days off, you're seen as lazy. And so people work all the time. So the Jews were, were laughed at because of this. As well, they were despised because the Romans did not require the Jews to participate in military service. Because if you have a whole unit of men who will not fight on Saturday, then your enemies know exactly when to attack you. Okay. So Jews were exempt from military service because they wouldn't fight on Saturday. They as well had very uh, successful businesses. Jews were, have always been known for making money, um, even in the first century. And so that was something that was seen as a, an ethnic, un, ethnic, unique thing for the Jews. And the Gentiles mocked them for it or despised them for it. As well, they were called atheists because the Jews did not have an idol of their god that could be worshipped. So they were referred to as atheists or what the word literally means without a god or without god. So the, they were mocked because of that. Now, Suetonius also calls them haters of humanity. Anybody think why the Jews might be called haters of humanity? I've heard this before. Well, they were called haters of humanity because the, Jew, the Gentiles believed, right? All the Greco-Roman world believed that if you did not worship the gods, then you would incur their wrath. And so in the city of Rome, there was a saying that when the Tiber floods, it's the fault of the Jews, that any time a disaster happened, it was the Jews' fault. 
because they didn't worship the gods. And because they don't worship the gods, you must hate everybody except yourselves. So they were called haters of humanity and despised because of that as well. Um, his name Tacitus tells us that everything the Gentiles called good, the Jews called bad, and everything the Jews called good, the Gentiles called bad. So there's a strong disdain between these two groups. And when Paul is bringing them together and talking about this dividing wall of hostility between these two racial groups being broken down, it is a significant thing. And the unifying of these two groups is incredibly important for a representation of the gospel. What Paul is essentially saying to the Roman church is that when you are dividing racially between each other, you are not expressing the reconciling work of Jesus Christ through the gospel. You are working backwards. Right? You're moving the gospel backwards. And that is an incredibly bold claim by Paul for this church. So there seems to be an isolation between the two groups simply because of their racial differences of what they practice and how they do things. They are dividing with one another. And they have been intentional in this. This is so intentional that uh, in the city of Rome, there was a distinct quarter of the city, a portion of the city that was only Jewish. All the Jews lived there. Right? And so already, housing-wise, the Jews and Gentiles live separately from another, one another in every city. And this is really because of the cleanliness laws of the Jews. So the Gentiles are separate from them already. So to bring them together is a huge step for any Jewish person. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. So if it's okay, I'd like to break. Uh, about every hour is that fine for us to have a break right now? Okay, so we'll take about 10 minutes. Um, come back at 10:40. Get rolling. We'll continue on talking about some other stuff. The historical background. Yes. All right. Okay. So let's let's take a look at the historical setting for Romans and see kind of what was going on with the church and the city before Paul writes the letter to the Romans. <clears throat> so the earliest that we see kind of some tension going on is around 19 AD. Tiberius Caesar expels the Jews from Rome. We don't know why, but he does. Okay. That's, we're just told about that in the history of the emperors. And <clears throat> he says... It is said that if they do not reject their faith, then they must leave Italy. And so at that time, it's recorded about 4,000 4, Jewish men of military age were expelled from the city of Rome itself. And then who knows how many from Italy. Now, we don't know really what happens, but the next kind of recording of Jewish presence in, um, in Italy really is in 40 AD or right around 40 where it's recorded there are about 13 synagogues in the city of Rome. Do you guys know how many Jewish men are needed to start a synagogue? Ten. Ten. Great. So this is at least 130 Jewish men, but synagogues were much larger than that oftentimes. And so this is a lot of Jews in the city of Rome. Okay? Um, 13 separate synagogues. Now, different than a city like Alexandria, in that Alexandria did have a central Jewish leadership. There was one kind of leader of the synagogues in the city of Alexandria, which is down, it's in North Egypt, down here at the top of the Nile River Delta. And in Rome, on the other hand, there was no central leadership. These were all separate synagogues. You know, they might have, like churches, they might have met together or something like that, but there was not one leader over all of them. Okay? And this seems to be then what happens with the churches. There's a lot of different churches, and then... There, but there wasn't seemingly one person over all of the churches. Okay. Yes. Were they expelled by? Yes, by Tiberius um, from all of Italy. But that was uh, forty-nine, so it was thirty years earlier that that took place. Yeah. yeah. So we do see that there is a presence then, um, and this is probably why Paul writes to all of those in Rome at the beginning of Romans chapter one instead of writing to the church of Rome, which he will tend to do. He will tend to write to one church in a city rather than to all of those in the city. And it is a few years after this, about 10 or 9 years later, that there is a riot that happens in 49, or a bit of rioting that takes place. Because one riot doesn't tend to get people kicked out of a city, but they keep rioting 
And in 49, Claudius expels the Jews from Rome. And you see this being evidenced in Acts 18, verse 2, where Paul, or where Luke records for us that Paul met Priscilla and Aquila after they had left from Rome because Claudius had kicked the Jews out of Rome. So this is a corroborated event, not just in Scripture, but also outside of Scripture as well. Good question? No? Yeah, where are you at? 18.2. Uh, Acts 18.2. And the riot, it's told to us that uh, this riot was over a man named Crestus. Okay. Suetonius records that for us. He's a Roman historian. And Suetonius tells us that this man's name is Crestus. Now, pretty much every single scholar agrees that this is just a misspelling of the name Christus. Okay. It is only one vowel off, the E and the I, or the Epsilon and the Iota. Uh, are only off one letter, and it is the same word. Christ, which we translate in English, the Greek word is Christos, Latin is Christos as well. And so what we see here then is this similarity here. It's only one letter off from Christus and Christus. So everybody thinks it's just a misspelling, and that the Jews in Rome were rioting over the preaching of the gospel rejecting Jesus, similar to what you find in other cities where the Jews are chasing Paul out of the city. Right? Or in Corinth, where they're beating up the synagogue ruler. And so you have these various instances. It seems like something like that was going on in the city of Rome as well. Sorry on the... Um, yeah, so 18.2, and then they're, but they're listed back in Rome in 16.3. So Priscilla and Aquila, Paul initially meets them in Corinth, but then the next time you find them chronologically, really, in the text, is when Paul is writing to the city of Rome and Priscilla and Aquila are back in the city of Rome. So something must have happened between 49 and when Paul is writing the letter, around 56 or so. So what happens between this time? How did the Jews get to go back to Rome? Well, in 54 AD, Claudius Caesar dies. The next emperor is Emperor Nero. You guys probably know who Nero is, heard a little bit about him, I'm sure, right? So you know how infamous he is. Okay, well, he comes to power in 54 AD, and he allows the Jews to return to Rome. Now, no one knows exactly why. He just welcomes all the Jews back. Now, there is some speculation that he welcomes them back because his wife is half Jewish. Okay, that's one thought no one really knows but it makes a good suggestion. Now, what we know about Nero in his later years is what makes him most infamous. Right? The persecution of Christians, the fire of Rome, all of that. Uh, and Nero, in his early years, is an excellent emperor. In fact, from 54 until the early 60s, or about 60, he is one of the best emperors since Augustus. And there had not been as many good years in a row since Augustus Caesar until Nero took power. Now, people ask why that happened. What was it about Nero that, um, that made these years so great? Well, it's thought to be because of his advisor. Um, Seneca was Nero's advisor. And around 60, Seneca retires. And Nero's mother dies. And then and Nero's other advisor, he has killed, all within a matter of a year or two. And it is from there that Nero starts to spiral out of control, and the empire goes downhill, and within only eight years, by 68 AD, the Roman military is calling for his death because he's sending the empire into an uncontrollable spiral. It's at that point that he commits suicide. Right? Uh, but he kind of just loses his mind after all these people abandon him in the early 60s. But before that, everything was great, hunky-dory. So let's, I wanna show you guys a, a quick picture, I'll need to find it real quick, um, of Nero and kind of his devolution. Um, So in the Roman Empire, it was very common to depict people on coins or busts, which are carvings of heads, 
uh, as they actually looked like. Okay? They didn't try to dramatize people. Like today, when you have a picture of somebody that's all photoshopped, and you ask the question, do they really look like that? Like there's no blemishes on their skin or anything. Um, in the ancient world, they did not do that. In the ancient world, they tried to depict people as accurately as possible because what they wanted was when you see the statue, you've seen the person. Or when you've seen the coin, you've seen the person. So we see this with Nero, and what's fascinating is what happens to him uh, in this period of time. Because what you find is you have Nero here, and at the beginning, you see these early years, and he's a very, he's prestigious, right? You see, I mean, you, you cut this out, and he, he looks like a pretty normal guy. Well, around the time of the death of his mother, the um, retirement of his advisor, and the killing of his other advisor, things really go downhill. And you see he gains tons of weight, he lets himself really go, his hair is crazy near the end of his life, right? And what you can see is kind of a mental break taking place in the depiction of coins. This is the ancient media. The coins are the Instagram of the ancient world. This is how you saw what was going on, was the minting of coins. And so you can see what's happening with the emperor through the coins, right? So this is what happens with Nero. So just a, a little kind of image for you guys to understand what's going on. Um, but Nero, you see at the beginning, right? He's well kept, well cut. He's a fit young man, ready to rule, right? And he's doing a great job. And that's what you see at the beginning of his reign and at the time of Romans. So when Paul writes this letter, this is kind of how things are going. Is the early years of his reign. Paul is writing right around here. Is that cool? Really, really interesting. Okay. <clears throat> so when Paul writes the letter to the Romans, it's been about two to three years since the Jews have been back in Rome. And since the Jews got back, things have been a little tumultuous. And they have devolved to the point where the Jews and Gentiles are now meeting separately. And so there's an extreme conflict amongst these two groups of people. And where the church was primarily Jewish before, now it is primarily Gentile. Okay? It seems that the, the churches were predominantly uh, populated by Jewish Christians or by those who had accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And then when they leave, of course, the church is strictly Gentile. Right? It's like, I mean, this is kind of an a, um, insufficient example, but it would be like if all of the staff on the Honolulu base were kicked off the base. Anybody who's ever been on staff here, anybody who has, uh, has ever led here or is leading here, just kicked off the base. They had to leave. Government told them they must leave the island of Oahu for whatever reason. The only people then that are left are students who have not been here. They haven't been on staff. They don't know how things function, and then they start to create the base around that. Right? They meet uh, staff meetings when they want to meet. They eat the food they want to eat. They run the kitchen they want to run it. They change the rules. Right? You guys just do whatever you want around here. And in a few years, all the staff are allowed to come back. And they come back on the base and they say, well, we're going to run it like we ran it before. We're going to have staff meeting on this day. We're going to have Thursday night. We're going to have meeting on Thursday night instead of Wednesday night like you guys changed it to. We don't like the schedule you've done for meals, and so we're going to go back to the way it was. And they start to go back to the rules thinking that they can just step back into where they were. And this creates a huge conflict. And the students on the base say, well, no, you guys have been gone for five years. This is how we run things now. And all of the leadership who's been gone for five years says, well, if you're going to do it that way, we're just going to go start our own base down in Waikiki. Right? And there's a huge a divisive separation between the two. Now they're not meeting together. right? They're not talking with one another. There is a strong divide between the two groups. And Paul looks at this and says it needs to be corrected. And so what Paul does to, to create this equality in Christ is to show and confront their ethnic privilege, the, way, the ways they have been elevating themselves and separating themselves. <clears throat> So Paul calls for an equal value in Christ for the churches to look at each other through Christ's eyes, through their need for Jesus, rather than through their differences. 
together. So cities, people dividing, not meeting, um, not honoring one another. Yes. So, did you guys, did you guys talk about that um, Judaism was a, a legal religion? Did you guys talk about that. Okay. So, anything older than the Roman Empire is legal. Any any religion older than than the Roman Roman Empire itself is permissible. But because Christianity was later than the Roman Empire, it would have been viewed as an illegal religion. But up until uh, Really, in, until the 60s, the Christians were viewed as Jews. It was viewed as a sect of Judaism. So the Romans don't treat Christians any differently than Jews. They just view them as the same type of people. So um, there wouldn't have been any kind of um, separation from the Roman Empire at that time, kind of a confrontation of them. Really, that happens in the 60s with New York. So the leaders, it wasn't just the leaders that were kicked out, it was the Jews that were kicked out. But because the Jews came to faith before the Gentiles, they would have been the natural leaders in the church. So the Jew, there were Jews at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, it says there were Jews from Rome. So we know that the Roman church probably started from some of those who were at Pentecost. And because the church started amongst Jews, which pretty much every happens in every single city, it's always Jews who preach the gospel to first, because that's the easy road way into the community. And so it is very likely that those who have been in the faith longer were the leaders in the church. And so now when you have the predominant, the predominant mature Christians leaving, who have kind of set the tone and what the church is about and how to operate and all these kind of things, then you have all these um, maybe less mature or believers who have been in Christ for a shorter period of time now are kind of running the show. Any other questions? Okay. So as well, there may there may be some criticism of Paul's gospel that could be going on in this letter. Uh, we potentially get that a little bit where he's confronting people about his gospel, maybe how he has been evangelizing. This could come up in chapter three, verse eight, where he um, confronts the the list or the readers, the listeners, and says, you know, some of us, some people, slanderously charge us with saying things like this, right? That we can just go on sinning and do whatever. We so there's going to be a few instances where it seems like people are criticizing Paul's gospel um, that goes on here. Now, one of the things that helps us as well date this book and some of the historical situation is the taxation issue in chapter 13, where Paul talks about paying taxes to the Roman emperor. Uh, this is like the only time, except for the gospels, where taxes are mentioned in the New Testament. So there probably is something going on. And in 56 to 57, I'm uh, sorry, 56 to 58, um, Nero instigated new taxation laws in the city of Rome. And Paul is now encouraging people who may have been disputing that or upset with that, hey, you guys should pay your taxes. Like, just you know, let it go. Right? That's your responsibility. You need to pay your taxes and quit complaining about it. But this was unrest not just amongst the church, but amongst all of Rome as a whole. And essentially Paul is saying, you as Christians need to set the example. Be Christ like. So let's talk about the purpose and reason that this book is written. Because it's helpful to know why Paul is writing so that we uh, can understand how to engage with it well. Well, there's three primary things that have been suggested for the reason of this writing. The first is that it is a written to show the church Paul's gospel, right? To explain his gospel message and then to confront his critics in Rome. Now, this is the classic kind of theological treatise that Paul is just writing to explain the gospel to a church in Rome, and the issues that are going on in dividing the church are totally secondary to Paul's purpose. The second is that Paul is wanting to use this church as a sending base, just like he did in Antioch. And so because of that, he's introducing them to his gospel message so that they might support him when he comes there, knowing what he believes, knowing his theology, laying it out very clearly for them so that they can endorse him when he comes there. And they get kind of a preemptive message. Because his anticipation is, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'll be there um, by, uh, be there in the spring, and then I'm going to head to you guys right after that. And Paul, I think, anticipates 
being in Rome by the end of the year. And I think he anticipates being there by the end of 57 or 58, depending on what it is. So I think this is a key thing for him in sending the letter. But like I've been saying, I think that really the one that underlies all of it, and these is um, sub points would be these other two, is that Paul is seeking to bring reconciliation for the Jews and the Gentiles in the city. And he does this by explaining the gospel message and showing that God, that Jesus has broken down this dividing wall. He has united all people in him. And so Paul calls for their unity. This wind is great. And of course, I think behind this as well as knowing that Paul was obviously on this reconciliation journey in 2 Corinthians, which we saw and what he was doing in Corinth. Now, at stake practically in in this book, what we see is really whether the Gentiles must obey the law in practice. This is a huge thing that comes up, is whether you must follow the law. Do you have to follow the dietary laws or the days to meet on or any other laws in the law of Moses? And that's really the practical thing, but really theologically is the gospel itself. This is what is key for Paul, is that it is the gospel that is at stake whether God's righteousness comes from obedience to the law or faith, right? Are those who are obedient to the law the only ones that will receive God's righteousness, or is it through faith in Christ? Without that, without uh, obedience to the law, then they wouldn't be included. So for Paul, this is a much bigger issue than just which day is right to meet on or which food is right to eat, but really faith in Christ, coming to God, receiving his righteousness. We'll talk about that righteousness quite a bit in this book as well. So the style of this letter. Because as you guys read the book of Romans, did you feel a little confused as you're reading it? It's kind of Paul going back and forth, jumping around a little bit. It kind of feels jumbled at times. It, it, it is um, almost like he makes some contradictory statements of things. Uh, and this is very key to what he is doing. Okay, the style of writing that Paul is using is called a diatribe. And this is where the author attempts to persuade his listeners of whatever truth it is, in this case, the gospel, through an imaginary dialogue. Okay? So Paul is arguing with an imaginary debate partner, and he, this style of writing primarily uses questions and answers. So Paul is going to ask questions, and then which are the natural questions? Right? When you read the book well, you should be asking the exact same question that Paul asks. Okay? So if you read chapter 1 and chapter 2 very well, then you should be asking the question that chapter 3 verse 1 is asking. Then what advantage has the Jews? You're like, what gives, Paul? Right? What is it? Why is there even any advantage? Is there any advantage for the Jews? Right? And then Paul's going to say, of course there is. Right? So if you're not asking the same question that Paul is asking, you've missed what he said. That is a very important rule for this book. So if at the end of chapter 5, you're not feeling that you should just sin as much as you want, because you will get more of God's grace. Right? And the more you sin, the more grace you get. If you don't feel that way at the end of chapter 5, you've missed it. You miss what he's saying in chapter 5, because chapter 5, verse or 6, verse 1, will say, so then shall we go on sinning that grace might abound? Because that's the natural conclusion of what Paul is saying. The natural conclusion is, I'm just going to sin as much as I want. I want more of God's grace in my life. I don't know about you guys. I love God's grace. Okay? And get more of it, I better sin more. Paul says, by no means. That is not what we are called to. Okay? So this is so key for us, you guys, is to ask the same question. And... In this style of writing, this phrase, by no means, is the classic refutation. And we get that, of course, in here. And then the author will painfully correct or take take effort to correct the misconception that is behind the question. So, when you get to chapters 1 through 8, you're right, you've read 1 through 8. What you will find, if you only read 1 through 8, sounds like God has just leveled the playing field so extremely that it makes you ask this question, well, what about Israel? Why did God ever choose? What's the point of Israel then? If this is what God is doing now, what 
the point of Israel? And that's why in chapter 9, verse 1, we have that exact question, right? Where Paul is going to ask them um, in... Uh, Or he's going to start talking about Israel, right? You should be thinking about, well, what now? What about these guys? And then Paul goes straight into talking about Israel. So we'll, we'll look at how these things unfold as we go through. We see this, of course, all throughout the letter. It's very easy to see. Um, but Paul, of course, at, is debating with mostly a, either a Jew or a Gentile. Sometimes it is both. Uh, but a lot of times it's his Jewish audience that he is debating with. So this is key for us as we... Uh, as we go through this letter, and we'll highlight a lot of these as we go along, and I'll continue to emphasize on this point. Okay. The next thing for us to be aware of, and what can tend to happen from this book, is that because this book follows a logical sequence, it's very, very logical in how, how Paul unfolds the whole letter, we can sometimes conclude that that is the logical sequence of the Christian experience. That because this is how it plays out in the book, it makes it very clear, it's very well reasoned, it's very logical. The Christian experience is just like that, right? Recognition of sin, um, this, just, this faith and justification and sanctification that happens. But the Holy Spirit isn't mentioned until chapter 8 in entirety, right? But his work is anticipated in the conviction of sin in chapter 2 and in the renewal that is going on in chapter 6. So we don't want to think that just because things are laid out logically, that that means that that is exactly the Christian experience with salvation. So we want to take that idea out and realize that Paul is trying to lay out an argument. He's not trying to lay out a systematic theology. Can you say that last thing over time? Yeah. To... Paul is trying to lay out an argument, not a systematic theology. Um, I don't know if you can answer this, but you're like, you're not asking the questions that Paul's asking you, I'm reading it right, like, you what he's saying. Is there a practical way that we can read the book so that we're doing that, or is like, is it an individual thing, or is yeah. it like... What I would recommend is, when you get to the question, if you don't understand why the question is being asked, then you would want to reread the portion he just wrote either the previous paragraph or back to the last question. Because what he ends up doing is he, he asks a question and he makes such a good argument for the answer to that question that it provokes a new question. Yeah. And so you don't have to read the whole thing again. Just go back to the last question. Say, do I really get what he's done since the last question or in the last paragraph or something like that? And that will really help to carry on that. Thing we notice a lot, I think some of us comment on it. Like, like, he's asking so many questions. Yes. And then he answers them. But exactly. Like all the time. Yeah. And sometimes the answer, the simple answer is such a broad sweeping statement, it can seem contradictory. And sometimes this imaginary debate partner that Paul writes with, quote unquote, um, he is just writing down their response or what they would say, and then he corrects what they would say. So that's what makes it a little challenging to follow sometimes, is that Paul doesn't believe everything he writes in this book. So you have to follow his train of thought, because he's going to write things from the stance of the person who's wrong, and then he's going to correct those things. So just because it's in there doesn't mean that Paul necessarily uh, believes that point. But obviously a lot, if he's trying to correct and present his gospel and show those things. But if there seems to be contradictions, that's there for a reason. Definitely, there is the element of, of like wisdom and foolishness that's going on from 1 Corinthians chapters uh, 1 and 2. That, that's always going on in the Roman Empire, for sure. Um, but I would say it's not as prominent of an issue inside the Roman church as it is in the Corinthian church. So the Corinthian church, or Corinth, is very well known for its traveling teachers because of where it's at on the Greek peninsula. But uh, Rome, not as much. So it's definitely present in their cultural environment, but it doesn't seem to be affecting the church per se, I would, I would say. 
Any other questions? Sure. What's this one? Let's look uh, at the structure real briefly. This will help us to see what's going on. Um, it is always helpful to have that structure in front of us to know what Paul is doing. Because this book can be a little dizzying at times, to know what's the main point of these chapters is really helpful. So I, I think that the book is fairly clearly laid out with some transition points. I'm, this could be broad. I'm not going to include the first references with this. But chapters 1 through 3 really lays out this idea of condemnation. And everybody's understanding. Right. Of course, that doesn't start until 118, and it goes on through the beginning of chapter, or through the middle of chapter 3, and then it transitions to that. But broadly, it's the first three chapters are really that everybody's under sin. The next chapters, 4 and 5, really highlight justification, and that uh, this is work, the question of, does justification come through works or through faith? And Paul's going to bring up Abraham, who is a key example in this, because the Jews believed excuse me, that he was righteous because of what he did. And we'll talk about what that looked like for them. The next we get chapter 6 through 8, where we're talking about sin, freedom from sin, and that idea then is sanctification, the process of becoming more holy. And this begins, the process of sanctification bit begins when somebody dies to something so that they can live to Christ. And Paul's going to talk about what the Gentiles have died to and what the Jews have died to. Chapters 9 through 11 ask this question that we have up on the board here about predestination, right, which kind of wrestles with this question who is a true Israelite? Right, who, who is Israel? And what is the deal with Israel now? The last portion gives us an exhortation and kind of the response. What do we do now? In light of all of this theology, what do we do now? And the beginning of chapter 12 really gives that to us uh, very clearly. And so, of course, we don't think of ourselves better than another. Um, we look at how race, racism is to be dealt with in the body of Christ and how that is supposed to, be, supposed to come to an end through Jesus Christ. And then we get the final greetings. The, there's another structure that I think could be helpful for us if we don't like that one, which we get the letter opening at the beginning, the introduction to a lot of the topics, and the thesis of the letter in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, and then from 18 through 425, really, this is the heart of the, just, heart of the gospel, which is justification by faith, which moves to the assurance that is provided by the gospel, which is that portion from chapter 5, which begins with the peace of God that has been received in justification. And if you don't know what justification is, we'll talk about that as well. And that's, I think, tomorrow is when we'll get to those chapters. Um, and this, we see the hope that comes in salvation and through salvation, which is then from God and through the Holy Spirit. And we see how the Holy Spirit works in our lives in chapter 6 and 7 and 8 for that. And then Paul gives a defense for the gospel. And when we talk about the problem of Israel, we're not talking about Israel as a problem, but the question of what do we do with Israel now? How do we deal with the question of Israel? And Paul answers that in his defense of the gospel in chapters 9 through 11. And then, of course, we get the transforming power of the gospel. It gives us the Christian conduct, how that's supposed to be lived out through most of chapter 15, and then the letter closing, which goes from chapter 15, verse 14, through the end of the book. And... The temptation can be that in a book that is so theologically dense, we, we would just focus on the first 11 chapters, or even the first 8 chapters, and that that's really where we would get most of the truth from. Chapters 12 through 14, and I would say 12 through 16, are incredibly important, especially 14, 15, and 16, are very significant for looking at these specific issues the church is going through, and for considering how we're to live in response to that, and to remember, these are very real people dealing with issues they take very seriously. These are not just throwaway issues. These are things their culture has been built on. And Paul is asking them to overcome so they can be 
Now, what you're not going to find in this letter, and we're going to kind of process through this a little bit as we go over the next couple of days, is you're not going to find in this letter Paul saying, Jews, you've got to eat pig. And you're not going to find Gentiles, you've got to stop eating pig. Okay? What you're going to find is a call for both of them to apply the gospel truth into their lives so they might reconcile with one another. So Paul provides them with all the tools and leaves it up to them to figure out what is the right thing to do? What is the most Christ-like thing for you to do in your relationship with another believer? And that's what the, the question Paul's going to ask in chapter 14. Paul will make a very, I think, um, very wise argument in chapter 14 where he will, he will say the wise must bear with, or the strong must bear with the failings of the weak. But I, I think it's, it is very, uh, very smart how Paul does this because he does not say who the strong are and he doesn't say who the weak are. Right. Now, we always tend to have the view that we are which ones. If I was to say, are you strong or weak? Strong, strong yeah. right? We all pretty much think we're always the strong ones, right? And I think Paul plays off of that human pride a little bit, right? Where he says the strong must bear with, bear with the failings of the weak. And the Jews would be like, wow, we're the strong ones. You know, Paul thinks we're the strong ones. The Gentiles are like, ah, oh, we're the strong ones, right? Paul's talking about us, right? And what it calls in is we're both to submit to the failings of the other person. And it calls every individual to look at the weaknesses of another person, and that's the standard to live their life from. So that's where Paul's going with all of this. So it is a beautiful journey as we go on, on this uh, through this book. Okay. So let's uh, begin to look at chapter one. Is there are there any questions over background, literature, structure, uh, anything like that? Feel like you already you guys already know the book a bit better now? How it flows? Yes. Why did they get expelled from Rome by Claudius in 49? Okay. So in 49 AD. There are there begin to be some riots that go on, right? Um, very loud, organized opposition to one individual, right? And the Suetonius, who is a Roman historian, records that the Jews were rioting about a man, or that the riots were instigated by a man named Crestus. Okay. Now. Like I, like I mentioned, every scholar agrees that it's probably a misspelling of the word Christus, which is the word for Christ. And so it is very likely the Jews are rioting over the gospel, over disagreement that Jesus is the Messiah. And because they're continually rioting over the, um, the gospel being preached, and, the reje and they're rejecting the gospel and saying that Jesus is not the Christ, and they're offended at the preaching of the gospel... Claudius decides to just kick the Jews out of Rome. Rather than just, if they're not calming down and they're not um, subsiding with their riots, he just says, just leave. So he sends the Jews out of the city of Rome. So that's, that is, does that make sense? Does that help? The Jews, yeah, the Jews that were forced to leave. But the thing is, is that forces all the Jews to leave, whether they're Christian or just, or not. Right? Whether they receive Jesus the Messiah or they reject him as the Messiah, all the Jews have to leave. So Priscilla and Aquila, who were technically Christians, are not Christians because that isn't really a word that's used. There's not a group of Christians. They are all Jews. Right? Because they are ethnically Jewish, they are forced to leave, just like all the Jews who rejected Jesus. So it's not like the Jews left and the Christians stayed. It's that the Jews left and the Gentiles stayed. So we don't want to categorize Jew as Christian, non-Christian. The, the term Jew in this setting is not a religious term, it's an ethnic term. Jew. Mm -hmm. It is. It's a shortened name of Priscilla. Yeah. Common nickname. Yeah. Any other questions? Sorry. Yeah. 
handle those because we'll move on. Um, if you guys do have questions as you're working on BRI or backgrounds today, tomorrow we can ask those questions also. So let's look at the introduction to this letter. Now, <clears throat> Paul's introductions to his letters are very important for us. What Paul will usually allude to or reference pretty much everything he's going to talk about in his introductions. Okay, so the, the intro is often a roadmap for the whole letter. And this is no different with the book of Romans. So we're going to see kind of how that plays out. Now, Paul, at the beginning of this letter, what does he start out with saying? What are the first things Paul says about himself? He's a servant. Okay? This is very important for us. Because Paul, when he's writing to a church he's never been to, he's writing to a church where a predominant number of the people do not know him. He refers to himself primarily as a servant of Christ and then as an apostle. So Paul is not coming, standing on the place of his apostleship and the authority to speak into the church and to guide the church. Rather, he's speaking it from the place of a servant from the church, and that's the primary designation. Paul does not always do this. Oftentimes, Paul will talk about his apostleship first, or he won't even mention that he's a servant. Only in a few of his letters will he do this. And so it is key here, as Paul opens the letter, that he refers to himself as a servant. But if you have the footnote in your Bible, what you will find is that it is the word doulos. The word doulos is the word for slave or bondservant. So Paul is not just calling him a servant, himself a servant in the home, but a slave of Christ. This is an important designation, I think, for any one of us to be aware of, is that Paul never calls himself a friend of God. Right? Nor do any of the apostles or any of the other disciples call themselves friends of God in the New Testament. It is just a, a, I think a significant observation. They refer to themselves as servants, or using the Greek, the Greek term of the first century, a slave of Christ. So that's how Paul opens up his letters. He is a servant. He's submitted. Um, that is his primary goal, is whatever the will of God is, that is what he wants to do. And what we see then him unfolding is what the will of God is for his life. Now, when we talk about the friendship passage, there's one, on a side note, there's only one passage in the New Testament that talks about believers being friends of God. In John chapter 15, verse 12. And in John chapter 15, verse 12, Jesus says, you are my friends because I make known the Father's will to you. Right. So because we know God's will, that's what gives us this privileged relationship, Right. is the knowledge of his will. But that doesn't make us any less slaves of God or servants of God, as we might be more akin to that language than slaves. But Paul still views himself as one who is seeking to fulfill the will of God as a servant of the gospel. So Paul lays it out here. Now, he views himself then as set apart for this specific message. And he, he says set apart for the gospel of God. And that will be what he will expound through the whole of this book is the gospel. And the reconciling power of the gospel is what's supposed to bring the church back together. And this word, aphorizo, is the same word that is used in Jeremiah, where God talks about Jeremiah being set apart for his ministry. And we see this throughout the scripture, that people are set apart for a specific ministry. And so Paul sees his life the same. That just like Jeremiah had a lifetime ministry, so he views himself as his call from the road to Damascus as being set apart for his whole lifetime. He mentions this in his earliest letter, Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, where he also talks about himself being set apart. Now, the first seven verses of the book of Romans has had more written about it in the past few hundred years than any other portion of Scripture in the entire Bible. And if we look at the whole scope of Christian history, this passage has had more written about it in the whole scope of Christian history than any other portion of the Bible. What is the gospel? Because Paul will expound this, and he will say, the gospel of God, which was promised beforehand through his prophets. And he goes through, and he kind of lays out what his gospel is. And so we see the basics of Paul's gospel. And this is what he will go through kind of in the book. What we will see is this gospel was promised beforehand. This is not something new that came out of thin air. It is promised by the prophets, or through the prophets, in the Holy Scripture. We see Jesus is the son of David. Right? A key element of the preaching of the apostles in the book of Acts. When we look at the book of Acts, we see them constantly talking about Jesus as the son of David. It was an essential aspect to the gospel message. That he was resurrected from the dead. 
Another key aspect that Paul will even preach to Gentiles who flat out reject the resurrection. Right? Now, most Jews accept the resurrection. So when Paul in Athens, in Acts 17, preaches, he says, Jesus, who was resurrected from the dead, they laugh him out of the area of Vegas. Right? They, they mock him because of resurrection. But this is a key element for his gospel. Jesus resurrected from the dead. And that he is our Lord, and that through him we receive grace. And that grace has a purpose. For Paul, grace is not just something nice that reconciles us to God, but it also empowers us to bring the gospel to the nations. And so Paul talks about the will of God here was for him to bring the gospel to the nations as well. That's part of his gospel, right? Is that we don't just receive it for ourselves, but to give it away to other people, which is what we see then with the Great Commission. Right? Go, therefore, and make disciples. So these are kind of the essentials of Paul's gospel that he lays out here. And what we see then, I think, is a dual presentation to Jews and to Gentiles. We have this, I think this picture helps us a lot, with the fact that Jesus, for the Jews, is the son of David, by the flesh. Right? He is affirmed as coming from the line of David, fleshly. Right? The Gentiles don't give a rip about King David. Who cares about some random Jewish king from history? Right? For them, it doesn't matter. For Jews, it is incredibly important that the Messiah comes from the line of David, because he is the one promised with the eternal kingdom. For Gentiles, on the other hand, the affirmation of him being the Son of God is, by the Spirit is important, right, to recognize uh, his deity. So we get the affirmation of his fleshly identity and his deity here, and that he is raised from the dead. So for both, right, this is dual expression, and that makes him Christ the Lord. Now, what we have to remember is that these, both of these words are titles, Okay, Christ and Lord are both titles, not names. Okay. So Christ means anointed one. This is the Greek word Christos, means anointed. And Christ, he is the Jewish expression, the Messiah, the King of the Jews. Right? The kings in the Old Testament were referred, referred to as anointed ones. When David is anointed, he is a Messiah. Okay? So the word anointed means to be the king. Right? The, the anointed king is the Messiah. So Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah, and he is the Lord, which was the Gentile expression. Okay. The word kurios, the word Lord, is a term that Caesar used of himself to say that he was Lord of the earth. Okay. So he calls himself the kurios. So these two expressions are very important for the Jews and the Gentiles, that this gospel is not just one that Gentiles were asked to receive as though they must become Jews but that the message of Jesus Christ, of his gospel, is one that is appropriate for both Jews and for Gentiles, bringing, him, uh, bringing God, them to God. Paul will continue from this place to refer to the, all of those in Rome as holy. Now, he uses the word hagios, which comes from the Greek word hagios, and this, uh, this is the plural form. Now, when Paul calls the churches saints, he's literally calling them holy ones. If we want to translate it directly, Paul calls them the holy ones. Now, that's an interesting title, especially for the Corinthians. Right? Um, all that you know about the Corinthians, Paul opens his letter and he says, to all the holy ones in Corinth, and you're like, who is that? Right? Where are they? Okay. Um, this, this is a designation of the identity of the churches, right? There is an, a dual aspect of sanctification. Okay? Most of the time in the Protestant faith, we talk about sanctification as though it is just an ongoing process. Okay? But the New Testament will use different language for sanctification. It says you have been sanctified. You are being sanctified, and you will be sanctified completely. In spirit, soul, and body. So we get um, being sanctified or being set apart is seen here in the saints picture. What that means is that we, as common vessels, as human beings, right, who have no prestigious purpose in and of ourselves, have been set apart for a holy purpose, which is to carry the indwelling Holy Spirit and to be messengers of the gospel. We are being sanctified by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to be holy, to live out the moral standards of God's character on the earth. And we will be completely sanctified 
when the refining process of the Holy Spirit is complete in our lives after death when we meet Christ and we will be completely sanctified. So this is an ongoing project. It started at our salvation and it will continue on all the way to the point of our glorification. And being set apart and being holy is the reminder of their identity in God. Each one of us is called to be holy simply by saying that we are saints or hagioi, uh, holy ones, is to say, uh, is to make a claim about our identity. We have already been set apart. We are already made holy. And we are in the process of becoming more holy. And as Paul then begins to get into the letter, he talks about his prayers. Paul's prayer for this church is something that he regularly lifts up. He says about them that he always pray, always mentions them in his prayers. Now, I think this would be quite meaningful for the church right at the beginning of the letter, considering the fact that Paul had never been there. Right? He knows a handful of people at the church, but he has not been to the city of Rome before. He doesn't know these churches firsthand, and yet he is praying for them regularly, remembering them, and recalling uh, these, these churches so that he might come there and impart to them a spirit spiritual gifts, right? sharing with them what he has received in the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, he talks about here, he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you. Okay? This, this word in verse 9 of service, where he is, uh, I, who God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit, will be the same word that Paul will bring up later on in chapter 12, where he will talk about our service. And the word uh, latruo is the word meaning priestly service, those who serve before God as priests. This is Paul's way of talking about his clerical service, right? Not just that he is a general servant, but he is like a servant in the temple, just like the priests were. And when we respond to the truth of the gospel and we give ourselves as a living sacrifice, this is our spiritual act of worship. Right? This is our service unto God in chapter 12, verse 1. It's the same word, latruo, that is used for our service rendered unto God, and all service rendered unto God. Um, what this means for us, you guys, like Peter says in 1 Peter, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Right? Priests are called to be representatives. Right? You guys they learn in the Old Testament that the priest is a representative. They represent God to the people. So when everybody brings a sacrifice to the priest, that priest receives it as though they are God. Right? It is like giving God a sacrifice, that giving it to the priest. And when the priest offers the sacrifice and sprinkles the blood and lifts up, uh, burns it, and the, the smell lifts up to God, that priest represents that person. They represent Israel to God. Okay? So they're dual representatives. This act of service is not just some nice religious service, but this, is, this type of service is a representative service. Right? Paul brings them before Christ in prayer. But as well, the Christians are called then to be living examples, to be representatives to the world around them, to the Roman church, to the Roman city. Okay? So their act of worship, their service of Romans 12, 1 through 2, is not just an internal service of worship to God in their own quiet times, in their own lives, but is a representative service to the whole of the city. So the question really being begun to be asked here, and I think Paul hopes to get stirred up, is what kind of example is your division to the city? What kind of example about Christ are you showing to the world? How are you representing him? Are you a good representative of God to all the world around you? Now, he's thankful for the church, he prayed for them, he longs to come and see them, and it says that he, he longs for to go and bring the gospel to all people, in verse 15, near the end of this chapter. He says he's eager to preach the gospel to them. They have received the gospel, but to continue to share it with them. Okay? And of course, we see in 15, he says, you know, my ambition is to go where the gospel is not yet, so that uh, all people might hear the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Now, Paul's ambition is to bring the gospel. And what does he say? He says uh, that, he, that he may reap some harvest amongst them as well as amongst the rest of the Gentiles. In verse 14, he says, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. And the interesting 
designation of these categories is that these are primarily a Gentile category and a Jewish category. Okay. The way that the, the Gentile world looked at the rest of the world was as Greeks and barbarians. So Greeks elevated themselves as though they were the best of the best. You get this through, uh, you get this exemplified in Hellenization. You guys know Hellenization with Alexander the Great. He goes around, he says, Greece is so amazing, everybody should be Greek. Right? So he teaches everybody Greek, or he makes everybody learn Greek, he teaches the philosophy, he passes on the religion, he passes on the gymnasium, the lifestyle, all these things. And so the Greek barbarian designation is a Gentile designation. Anybody who didn't speak Greek, the Greeks called them barbarians. Now, the word barbarian in, uh, in Greek is the word barbaros, and the reason that this uh, word was uh, originated, or the the way it was coined was more of as an onomatopoeia. Uh, if you guys know, it's a word that sounds like uh, what it means. Okay. And what the Greeks said is anybody who doesn't speak Greek just sounds like they're saying bar, 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 bar. And so they're bar, bar, Aryans, right? Bar, bar, Ross. And so that's the way of labeling anybody who doesn't speak Greek is just a bar, bar, Ross. Okay. Uh, and it's their way of degrading anybody, right? Oftentimes, our labels of people tend not to be elevating labels, but degrading labels, right? Just like Christians. The word Christianus is a Greek word that just means something cute, right? Or Christian is cute, right? In uh, English, we say, oh, you're toesies. Oh, you little toesies are so cute. That's like saying, oh, you little Christiansies, right? It's, it's just a cute designation for Christians. Other languages have this. In Spanish, uh, you speak Spanish? Uh, it's uh, uh, like poquito. Right, ego, right? You can add that onto the end of pretty much anything, right? Uh, and it makes it cute. Okay? So Christians are the same thing. Oh, you're just cute little Christs, right? But it's a derogatory way of doing it. Yeah. So, so, uh, so here, the Greeks are saying, you know, anybody who doesn't speak Greek is a barbaros. Okay. Now, the Jews created their designation of wise and foolish. Anybody with the law was wise. Anybody who was without the law was a fool in darkness. Right? Where does that designation come from? Proverbs. Okay? Anybody who has the law is wise. They fear the Lord. They know God. And those who don't have the law, they don't know God. They are fools. Right? And a fool, you see in Proverbs, is really the most pitiable person on earth. Right? So these designations are very clear for two different groups. And Paul says, you know, I'm called to the Greeks and the barbaros, right? I'm called to the wise and the foolish, right? Paul makes it very clear that he makes no distinction, right? He uses both designations. He says, you know how you elevate yourself? You know, I'm called to you and I'm called to the people you don't like. And so it asks the question of us, you know, do, do we, are we willing to bring the gospel to those who are different than us? How do we categorize those that are different than us? And when we bring the gospel to people, are we trying to make them like us? Right. In the sharing of the gospel, in our evangelism, are we trying to make them like us? Okay. Are we trying to show that Jesus is their savior in their context, in their culture, for them as a people? Paul wants to reform a family, which is really what Jesus is doing. Jesus is reforming a family around himself. So, how are we trying to make people like us instead of like people? All right. I realize I've gone a little past where I wanted to break at. Uh, so, can we take a five, or it's uh, 37, let's start at 45, and it's about a seven minute break or so. Sound good? Okay. All right, so let's press onward into the rest of chapter one here. <clears throat> so Paul, we're going to uh, finish up looking at Paul's intro. So we got through the first 15 verses or so, highlighting some key things. And then in verse 16 and 17, Paul really gets into the thesis of his letter. Okay, this is going to be kind of where everything starts from and where he is pushing off from is 
this, this key statement here. Right? I am not ashamed of the gospel. Right? And of course, we know Paul clearly is not ashamed of the gospel as he is willing to suffer, uh, be persecuted for it. Whether that is social or cultural shame upon him means nothing to him. Right? You saw in 1 Corinthians, the opening portions, how foolish the gospel is to Gentiles and to Jews. Right? And yet Paul is willing to bear the shame upon himself to bring the gospel so that some might be saved, so that some might hear it and be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Right? Paul doesn't rely upon his own presentation of the gospel, but upon the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Right? It's not how well or how bad he presents it, but that the Holy Spirit will convict people of it. Right? He doesn't put that pressure on himself, and because there's no pressure for him to convict people of the gospel, he has no shame in presenting it. Because it doesn't matter, right? If he gets persecuted or not, because it is not himself that it relies upon. So he doesn't have to present it in a way that has no shame, right? So he's not ashamed of any part of it. And he's not ashamed because of what the gospel is about. It's the power of God for salvation, to be saved. Now, the word salvation, sozo, um, or soteria, sorry. Uh, sozo is the verb to save. Um, but salvation, soteria, is a word that is like a rescue, right? Not just, this is not a spiritual salvation in the usual sense of the word that we tend to use it, but is a general rescuing from perilous danger. And that's really what the gospel is, is rescue from the perilous danger that would come from the consequences of sin. Okay? So this is salvation, right? Salvation, of course, uh, entails all of the process from the moment of commitment of life to Christ all the way to the very end. Salvation is not just one moment where someone's saved, right? That is the justification portion, right? But we are saved, being saved, and will be saved, right? We use some specific words for that when we talk about justification, sanctification, glorification. We'll expound on those things a little bit. But Paul says that it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to so the Jew first and also to the Greek. So what does Paul mean when he says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I think it's helpful here to start out with this because this is where the first time Paul mentions it. Now, really, nobody would think this is a preferential statement. Right? You don't find anybody who takes the whole Bible seriously that this is Paul putting preference over one group to the other, but rather this is a chronological statement. Okay? The, the gospel came first to the Jews, of course. We see that very clearly in the book of Acts. Right? The gospel is preached to the Jews at Pentecost, it's preached to the Samaritans, part Jews, it's preached to those who are God-fearers, and it is not really until the gospel goes to Antioch in chapter 11 of Acts that it starts going to Gentiles strictly. Right? Even Cornelius is a God-fearer, so he attends synagogue and things like that. But it's not until Antioch that the gospel begins to go to Gentiles, and then in Paul's first missionary journey. So, it is, this is more of a chronological statement to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Paul follows that same pattern, right? Even though we see Paul says of himself, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. But every town he goes to, he goes to the synagogue first. Doesn't sound very much like an apostle to the Gentiles to me, right? But what Paul looks at is primary ministry is to the Gentile world, but he will not withhold the gospel from the Jewish community either. And of course, the synagogue makes a very easy inroad in any community to preach the gospel. Any traveling rabbi could go to the synagogue and share on a Saturday morning whatever they would like to to encourage the community. And so the synagogue makes a very easy inroad for Paul, who was a Pharisee and probably maybe still came across that way to Jews, to present the gospel of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So that's probably what Paul is talking about here, because what he is going to lay out through the whole of the gospel, through the whole book of the Romans, is that there is no privilege. There is no preference. There is no partiality. And because of that, that statement does not correlate with the rest of the gospel unless it is a chronological statement. Okay. Or with the rest of the book of Romans, excuse me. So then he'll say, for the gospel, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So when we talk about this righteousness of God, this is the first introduction to really, this phrase, the righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? What does this mean for us as we go through this book? Well, there's a couple things for us to keep in mind. Okay. The Greek words, dikaiosune and dikaiao, are, come from the same family. 
and we translate them a few different ways. Okay, we're going to touch on this a little more tomorrow, but just to be aware of, that when you see righteousness, righteous, justice, or just, that's all the same thing, justified, justification. Anytime those words come up, it is all the same root family of words. Okay? And it's a little harder to catch it in English because just, just and right, righteous don't look anything alike. Two totally different words. Right? But the Greek is the same word or the same family. So we get the verb, the adjective, and the noun all looking the exact same, um, which is uh, delta, iota, kappa. Um, that's the same root family, um, D-I-C for us. So uh, Paul here talks about the righteousness of God. He's going to introduce this term. So when we talk about the righteousness of God, what do we mean by the righteousness of God? Well, one of the classic ways is a subjective thought on the righteousness of God. Okay? This construction in, in Greek, righteousness of God, is what is called, it is a genitive construction. That's just a, a form of, of uh, speech. So there's a genitive construction, which could be translated as God's righteousness, as though he possesses it, or a righteousness that comes from God, as though it is given from him. Okay? So that's the way we're looking at this phrase. So the first way is a subjective genitive, which means that it is something that comes from God, right? Or that uh, he is giving it to us. Okay. And this is what Luther looks at God's righteousness as. Is God shares his righteousness with us. When, he, when we are justified in Christ, we are counted as righteous, which we will see in chapter 3. Now, the other perspective is that this could be an objective righteousness which means that it is God's possessed righteousness, God's right actions. So it's not necessarily when it's coming from him, but it is his right actions. And so we see this could be possible, right? The gospel both reveals the righteousness that comes from God, but the gospel reveals God's right actions, his just actions in the sacrifice of Christ for the sins of humanity. So we do see the the just actions or the righteous actions of God's God towards sin. Now, could both of these be at play? And this is one of the things that scholars debate over is whether a genitive construction like this, where you have of in there, righteousness of God, could mean both things. Righteousness that comes from God, but also his actions. And I think that that is the better way to understand this. Rather than either or, but we look at it as expressing both ideas. And so we see this idea in this, the righteousness of God manifested in the provision of salvation. That's God's right actions. And as a result of God's right actions in the gospel, in the death of Jesus Christ, believers are granted a righteous status before God, right, which we receive through justification or us being counted righteous. We're going to explore that specifically in chapter 3 when we get there tomorrow. And so this will be an ongoing discussion. But this is, this is two of the primary ways that righteousness for the Protestant traditions has been understood through this book. So when we see the righteousness of God, some people are going to suggest that this righteousness is God's right actions, which sometimes fits incredibly well and even better than receiving righteousness. And other times it will just be that it is the righteousness that is coming from God that we are viewed in light of that righteousness. But either way, it is the gospel itself that reveals the righteousness of God, right? Both his right actions and that in the gospel it is revealed that we stand in the righteousness of Christ through faith. And that's where Paul continues on. Because the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Yes, Chance. Is that empty, right? It is, yes. Which one? Oh, we're about, it's right here in verse 17. Yeah, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So, what does is, what is this uh, statement mean? Okay. We get from faith for faith. Well, there there is a bunch of ways to explain this. In fact, depending on which scholar you read, you'll find a variety of options. And there is roughly about 10 different ways that people have suggested that this phrase can be understood. Okay. So I'm going to give you just the most common 
options for what people think this phrase means, from faith for faith. Because the preposition that's used here, um, which we translate as for in the ESV, where it says from faith for faith, that preposition for in the Greek has a wide variety of options for translation. So you may have a footnote uh, which says the beginning and ending in faith. Um, and so there's a few different ways of translating it, but we can understand it potentially as from faith for faith alone, or faith and faith alone, right? The righteousness of God is revealed by faith and faith alone. Okay, that's one way of understanding it. Um, one way that, another way to understand it is that from faith of the Old Testament believers for the faith of the New Testament believers, right? The righteousness of God is revealed from the faith of the Old Testament believers for the faith of the New Testament believers. Now, this option is a widely agreed upon one. A lot of people like this one because Paul shows that Abraham's faith revealed God's righteousness. And he emphasizes that in chapter 4. It's a huge part of his argument. And then, this would be for the faith of the New Testament believers, so that Abraham's example of righteousness by faith might be an example for us now to receive the righteousness of God by faith also. So that is a fairly decent option for, for us. We also might see it as Christ's faithfulness that has resulted in the believer's faith. And the reason we could translate it this, it, it would be, it would read, the righteousness of God is revealed from faithfulness for faith. Okay. Now, the word uh, pistis and pistuo, the noun and the verb, which we translate as faith or to believe or to have faith, um, can carry the idea of faithfulness as well. There's an adjective that we use to describe faithfulness. Um, and the constructions of the word of the noun and the adjective are, can be the exact same. And sometimes the adjective or the noun might be in place. Now, context usually determines this very clearly for us, but here it could be either one of these, faithfulness or faith. So whatever it is, what we see clearly is from the quotation that it is by faith that we shall find life. So the, the quote from Habakkuk, where it says, the righteous shall live by faith, means that we shall have life by faith. The righteous shall live by their faith, is a more explicit way of translating it. So we are living, we find life by our faith. So this is Paul's key opening statement. Although it is to the Jew first, it is also to the Greek. Right? There is no distinction between the two of them. Right? God's righteousness is revealed. God's right actions are on display. And we receive this righteous standing with God. And it is by faith that we will receive this righteous standing. And by faith that we see the action, right actions of God. And that we will find life by that faith. So there is a lot here in these very few verses, one, one real meaty sentence here for it. Any questions on it? I know there's a lot going on. I expect there may be some confusion. Try to be as clear as possible uh, with it. But we want to keep going back to it, keep wrestling over it. I, I myself, Every time I'm prepping for the book of Romans, this is one of the passages I spend a lot of time thinking about, looking back at, uh, because it's so key for Paul's letter. Now, Paul continues then in chapter 1, verse 18. And this is where he'll transition more into the body of the letter. So he, his 1 through 17 is kind of the intro, and now it's the body of the letter. And in the body of the letter, Paul begins... Um, really in the past three verses by talking about three key things that are demonstrated or shown from God. Okay, the first is the power for salvation. In verse 16, we see the power of salvation is revealed through the gospel. In chapter or verse 17, we see that the righteousness of God is revealed. And then in verse 18, Totally unexpected, right? It's not where you'd think Paul would start the gospel, right? He says, the wrath of God is revealed. Okay. So power 
righteousness and wrath are the three things Paul is beginning with in the revelation of God, what has been revealed from God. And what Paul says here is that it is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, what Paul will do throughout chapter 1, verse 18 through 32, is lay out a picture of Gentile unrighteousness. Now, how do we know that Paul is emphasizing Gentile unrighteousness in this or in these paragraphs at the end of chapter 1, the second half of chapter 1, I should say? Is there anything in here that would clue you in to these, this being about Gentiles and not about Jews? What in it would clue you in? Ungodliness? Yeah, so maybe some ungodliness and unrighteousness, for sure. But uh, the Jews also deal with some ungodliness and unrighteousness. Suppress the truth. Supp suppress the truth? Yeah, maybe that, that one points towards them. Looking for some co really practical things, really concrete things from here that would give us a clue that these are Gen that Paul's talking about Gentiles. They did not honor him as God. Good. So that is definitely one of them. Idolatry. idolatry, right? So they keep making idols. Jews at this time have not had stumbled with idolatry for more than 500 years. After the exile, it is it was completely eradicated from the Jewish community. The Jews did not struggle with it at all. And so for Paul to emphasize that and bring that up here, that people who are still giving themselves over to idols would then inherently be Jews as well. The other thing in here is the handing over of natural relations, right? men with men and women with women. Um, homosexual practices were totally unknown to the Jewish communities. Uh, there, it was something that was not this, um, talked about or even present in any Jewish communities that anybody can tell. So this is something that is totally foreign, but something that is totally known and familiar to a Gentile audience. And Paul talks about, begins to speak of the wrath of God. Now, for the next two and a half chapters, Paul is going to talk about the wrath of God against ungodliness, right? the judgment of God, or what we have termed in my structure, condemnation. Now, Paul is going to lay out the bad news. And he's going to show how bad the bad news is to show how good the good news is. Right? And this is something that we tend to shy away from when we share the gospel with people, is to tell people the bad news. But the good news is not as good as we try to make it unless we understand how bad the bad news is. If we don't understand how bad our situation is, how poor off we are, then we don't really think we need Jesus that bad. Right? It's just like Jesus is talking about the prostitute to the Pharisee and says, the one who has been forgiven much loves much. Right? If you don't realize the detriment of your situation without Christ, it's not very meaningful to receive Christ because you think you're pretty well off. But Paul lays out so clearly, this is how bad off everybody is. This is how bad the bad news is. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness. And what we find then is what man has exchanged. Three times in these paragraphs we see that man has exchanged something. They've exchanged God for idols. They've exchanged truth for a lie. And they have exchanged the natural things for the unnatural things. And when Paul talks about God's wrath, we don't see it in this passage as something supernatural in judgment coming down upon people, as though fire from heaven is striking them, or lightning is destroying them, or anything like that. When Paul talks about it, he talks about the wrath of God being revealed um, from heaven against ungodliness. And the word that Paul seems to use is handed over, right? Multiple times he talks about them being handed over. Okay? We have this in verse 24 where it says that he gave them up. It, well, in the, in the ESV it says gave them up. Um, in other translations it will say handed over. But uh, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts. God gave them up to the dishonorable passions. God gave them up to a debased mind. And this is the way that Paul talks about it. Is that God gives people up to the thing that they are desirous of. And this is something we don't like very much, right? We want God to give us what, it, what we want when it's good for us, right? But in the same way, Paul says, if you want something, God's going to give you that thing, right? He's just going to give you over to it. And in here, humanity wanted to dishonor God. God says, sure, go for it. Give you over to that, right? 
God is not coming along and protecting anybody from their sin. In fact, there's only one time in the whole of Scripture where God prevents anybody from sinning. It's in Genesis, where God prevents Pharaoh from sleeping with Abraham's wife, with Sarah. It's the only time in the whole of Scripture that God stops somebody from sinning. Otherwise, he gives them over to it. If that's what you want, then that's what you can have. And that's what we see here. That is the wrath of God, is people suffering the natural repercussions of their ungodly choices. And that's what we see here, is that they are reaping the consequences of their decisions. And that is demonstrated for Paul in this passage as the wrath of God revealed against ungodliness. That people will reap the consequences of their decisions. Now, the natural response is, is well, how do, how do people know? How are they supposed to know? And, and Paul addresses that right at the beginning. Right? God is no, has made himself known to people. Verse 10, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in all things that have been made. So they're without excuse. Right? Nobody has an excuse that they could not have known. Right? This, is, this is Paul's argument. is Just from nature around us, you can tell that there is a creator. So, so Paul's argument is for natural theology, that there is an element of the awareness of a creator simply by the world around us. Now, will our observations of nature lead us to a saving faith? Not necessarily, right? There, there isn't anything necessarily in nature that tells us that we need a redeemer or that God is sending a redeemer. But the awareness of God himself, who should be honored and worshipped, through our observation of creation is evident, according to Paul in Romans chapter 1. What he says instead is that instead of, of worshiping and glorifying the invisible creator, man has chosen to worship things that resemble themselves and things less than themselves, which is Paul's confrontation for, uh, for anybody outside of the faith, is that they are worshiping that which is less than themselves creatures, the uh, images of mankind, rather than worshiping God. He gives them over. Right? Now, Paul uses a number of different examples. He talks about idolatry. He talks about um, dishonoring passions um, and worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. And then we see Paul talking about dishonorable passions in their bodies, right? exchanging natural relations for unnatural relations. And this is one of the uh, key passages that will be talked about with homosexuality. So it is helpful for us to examine Paul's um, point here. Because what Paul is doing is he is using an example, but not the epitome of fallenness. And what some people will tend to do is to highlight this as though Paul is saying, this is the chief end of fallen humanity is homosexuality. But that's not what Paul is doing here. He's simply using an example to display what it looks like when humanity has given up honoring God, and instead honors themselves and worships themselves. Okay. Now, Paul talks about this by using this keyword, uh, atomia, which is the word that we translate dishonorable. Okay. Uh, dishonorable passions. It's the, it is the opposite of honorable, where they're supposed to honor God. Instead, they are dishonoring him and honoring themselves. This is to count themselves more worthy. Time also carries the idea of worthiness with it. And rather to say that we are worthy rather than God. We shouldn't give our honor to God, rather to ourselves. And this is the same thing from the Garden. Right? Is that from the Garden of Eden, humanity has decided that they know best. And when Adam and Eve took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they already knew what good and evil were. God had said, don't eat from the tree. That is knowledge of an evil decision. They knew what was good, right? Eat from the tree of life and obey God, right? Don't eat from the tree. So they had an awareness of a intellectual knowledge of what good and evil were. When they eat from the tree, they are deciding for themselves what, that they will decide what is good and evil. They eat from the tree and they say, what God calls evil, I will call good. And what God says is good, I will call that evil. And from the very beginning of creation, Humanity has been in rebellion against God's 
uh, proclamation of what is good and what is evil. And we see here, with this example, that mankind has called good what God has called evil. So Paul uh, uses that in, as an example here. Uh, interestingly, Paul is the one of the only authors in the ancient world. There's only three of them, and Paul is one who talks about lesbianism as though it is uh, who talks about lesbianism at all. Right? Paul says here that women give up unnatural relations for relations with women, okay. and Paul's the only author to condemn this activity, uh, but the other two talk about it in a morally neutral way. Okay. Homosexuality in the ancient world is very well known. Uh, everybody is familiar with it amongst adults and what is also called uh, preteristy, which is what some people will suggest Paul is talking about of um, a man, uh, an older man or a man in his 20s and a younger boy, somebody in his teens, um, that kind of homosexual relationship. But adult homosexual relationships were also very well known. So Paul's not just talking about one categorization, but homosexuality in general. And that is an example of humanity loving themselves. Okay. So Paul, really his emphasis in the first chapter uh, is to demonstrate how far away man has fallen from God. We see this vice list here, common in the ancient world. Uh, of listing of all of the fallen traits of humanity. We see the, this list of four things, those who reject God, uh, these five things of people's attitude, and then characteristics of unrighteousness. But concluding all of this, where Paul points towards what the wrath of God revealed against humanity looks like, uh, people giving up their natural inclination towards God to worship themselves instead or worship what is in creation, it comes to the conclusion where Paul kind of highlights what is the worst thing. And the worst thing at the end of all of this is that man approves of the evil that other men are doing. Where it says, yes, that is the right thing to do. It is the right thing for you to do the evil that you are doing. And that, For Paul, that is the epitome here of what it looks like to fall away from God. Though they know God's righteous decrees that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. And this is, a, I think, a very helpful gauge for us, you guys, is how do we think about the actions of the world? Do we just say, oh yeah, you do you. you know, just whatever you want to do, that's great, you do that. Right? Or is our posture towards the holiness of God, that we call evil what is evil, what God calls evil, and we call good what God calls good. Right? Are we giving approval towards the actions of the world, the things of the world? Right? We know that these things lead to death, and yet they're approved of. And this, is, this really gets to the heart of what humanity wants in general, is approval. Right? Humanity wants approval from one another. Right? And when people are not approved of, they tend to switch the things they're doing. Here, of course, that's one of the things that, uh, that makes it toughest to be a Christian, is the world does not approve of that which we do. It tends to persecute it, reject it, confront it, uh, disregard it, hate it, whatever it is, uh, because it, it does not fit with the world's system, their lifestyle. Uh, so the question for us, you guys, really, whose approval are we seeking in our lives? Right? Are we seeking the approval of the world, seeking to be approved by the people around us, seeking to be approved in what we do by humanity, or is our prime desire to be approved by God? Is our prime desire for God to be the one who gives us the greatest approval? And so I think this is a, a key, key conclusion for Paul here. Is that it's not just that the Gentiles have sinned, but it is just as bad that people are approving and saying, yeah, that's good. It's right for you to do that. Any questions in chapter one? I think that didn't talk about. Okay. So when we get to chapter two then, well, let's, let's look at this. 
If you're a Jew reading chapter one, how do you feel right now? Pretty good, right? You're like those Gentile sinners, right? Paul, you tell them where they came from, remind them how bad they are, right? This is kind of their attitude. I think Paul does this on purpose. Okay? He said, you read chapter one, and if you're not a Gentile idolatry, you feel pretty good about yourself. You're like, this is right. Like, Paul, tell them the truth, right? This is what I want to hear, right? And then you get to chapter two, verse one. And what is the opening line of chapter 2, verse 1? Therefore you have no excuse, O man. Every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you who judge practice the very same things. Now, you're not really going to find out who the you is in this passage until verse 17. Paul sets this up like one of the prophets. Now, a lot of times in the prophets, they will talk about a city or a people, and they'll talk in generalities. And then, once you get to kind of the climax of the statement, they will turn and point towards them. You think of Isaiah 5. We're in Isaiah 5. Isaiah's talking about this vine and talking about how God had planted it and cultivated it. And we know where it's going. But at the, right at the climax of when it talks about the destruction of the vineyard, Isaiah says, it's you. Right? You are the vineyard, right? And that's what Paul does here. He's highlighting, you know, trusting in God's kindness, expecting him to be partial to you, thinking that having the law makes you somehow better. And then it's not until verse 17 where you get this confrontation of, but if you call yourself a Jew, right? And then goes through some more confrontation in these conditional statements. But this is what Paul is, is transitioning then. He's going to highlight the Jewish perspective, how they thought of themselves, and how that uh, confronts their own attitude in light of their gen the judgment against the Gentiles. So, Paul opens with this statement, right? If you're judging people for those things, you're doing the exact same things. Right? You are under the same condemnation. Now, the key verse of this chapter is verse... 11. Verse 11 says, for God shows no partiality. Okay. Now, we like that verse when we think about gifts of the Spirit or rewards in heaven or something like that. That tends to be how we use that verse. Oh, God shows no partiality. He loves you all the same. How is Paul using this verse? When you read this passage, Paul is using this verse, God shows no partiality, to say, oh, don't worry, you're all going to be judged the same. Right? You are all sinners. You are all going to see, receive the same wrath from God. Right? The, he's not saying, oh, there's no partiality in, in whatever rewards in heaven. He's saying there's no partiality in the justice of God. Right? Everybody can expect the same thing. Okay? And so Paul opens the chapter by emphasizing that all have sinned. Right? Everybody has sinned. Right? You can't think that you are somehow better off. And in this, the Jews clearly expect partiality because of the kindness of God. Verse 3, do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Do you think that? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? This is very real, right, for the Jews here, of course, that they're thinking they're fine, they're well off, that they are doing everything okay because they are not experiencing the wrath of God, because they are not being judged. And what Paul says is the delay of God's judgment is not the approval of your actions. That delay, that patience of God, the forbearance of God, is his kindness that is meant to lead you to repentance. And this is so key for us as Christians, you guys, is that we do not presume that simply because we're not suffering for sin in our lives or, or doing something wrong, that we're somehow right, that everything's okay, and the grace of God just covers everything, right? God's grace is so vast, it's so lavish, right? But our perspective cannot be that simply because we live in a sinful lifestyle that God is somehow approving of us because we're not suffering for it. God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. 
patience is meant to lead us to repentance. This is the key for the Jews here, that their division from the Gentiles, their separation, uh, is not right. And Paul says, you should be repenting for your sin. Right? God's patience to you is his grace. It is his mercy. Right? And verse 5 says, but because of your hard and impenitent hearts, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, and God's righteous judgments will be revealed. Pretty bold statements for Paul here. What Paul will then go on to in the remainder of this first part will be to say that all need a Savior. None are less in need of a Savior than anybody else. Just because the Jews had the law doesn't mean that they didn't need a Savior just as much as their gent the Gentile sinners around them. Everybody needs Christ. Okay. And this is how Paul resolves the issue of racism. Paul doesn't come along and tell the Gentiles, oh, don't worry, you're just as good as the Jews. Right? He's not doing that. Right? Don't, don't worry, you're just as good as they are. God loves you just as much as he loves them. Right? That's, that's what we tend to do. Right? Paul would write to the Jews and say, hey, you guys, you need to stop looking down the Gentiles. They're just as valuable as you are. Right? God loves them just as much as he loves you. There's just as great a promises for them as there is for you. That's what we tend to do in racist situations. What Paul does is says, hey, you know what? You're just as much of a vessel of wrath as they are. You need Jesus just as much as they do. You are just as much a sinner as they are. He tears both groups down to the bottom to show how much they need Jesus. And the reality is anytime we think we're better than somebody else, we have got to remember, I needed Jesus just as much as they do right now. Right? And that's, that's what Paul does. That's what, the way he brings them all into equal standing is to say we are all sinners destined for the wrath of God and every single one of us needs to Jesus. Now, that should start to make you think, well, what advantage has the Jew, right? If the Jews are just as poor off as the Gentiles, if they are just as sinful and they are just as subject to God's wrath as the Gentiles, then what makes it good to be a Jew anyways, right? Is that kind of a good question for us to ask? Paul thought so as well, right? Well, he, that's what he gets to in chapter 3. Well, what advantage does the Jew have then? For all sinners, why does it matter if I'm a Jew or not? That's what Paul will get into. No. Yes. Yeah, eth ethnically. But, I mean, in this case, it's Christians. Of course, he's writing to Christians. So, Jewish Christians. No. Ethnically Christian. Jewish and Uh, become like an ethnic Jew? No. Right. Anybody who from the family of Israel is ethnically Jewish. Yeah. And they thought because they were born from the family of Abraham that they were better off. Um, and also that they are keeping the law as well, because that's their culture. Right. It's, it, I don't know if you guys found this intriguing, but the fact that the church is, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem and the church are still practicing observation of things at the temple. 30 years after Jesus, is a, a pretty significant insight into the fact that Jesus never calls them to abandon their culture, right? but just to accept him as the Messiah. Right? Now, you don't see them offering sacrifices for sin, right? but offerings in fulfillment of vows, right? commitments to God. I'm going to do this for God, an offering of a vow, in, or um, uh, the response of a vow, the fulfillment of a vow. So it's interesting, right? So that aspect of the Jewish culture is still very present for them. Yeah. Okay. So in 12 through 16, what Paul, I think, is, is doing two things. Okay? Because in this paragraph, it can be a little bit testy. Right? Well, it seems like Paul is saying that anybody who doesn't have the law can just go off of their conscience and then could be saved. If they live according to their good conscience, then maybe God would save them. How do people live without the law? And that's kind of the question. And, and Paul's kind of really, really the point of this paragraph is to confront the Jews. If you think you have the law, but you're not doing the law, then you are missing the whole point. You think that just by possessing this piece of writing, that somehow you're better off or more likely to be saved, you totally miss the point. And so I think what Paul does is kind of create a hypothetical situation where it's like, if there was a Gentile 
right, that keeps the entire law, he would be more of a, more of a, uh, destined for salvation than you who simply have the law but don't do the law. Now, there, there could be this idea that, you know, could someone keep that, keep a law of their conscience and could that lead them to salvation? And what Paul is ultimately going to show in chapter 3 is that nobody is righteous. Nobody can save themselves. Nobody could perfectly keep the law. If they didn't have the law and they just followed their own conscience, that's not going to save them, which is why I think this is a hypothetical situation. It's because chapter 3 will make that so obvious that nobody can save themselves. Nobody can keep a law well enough to work themselves to God. Everybody must put their faith in God for their salvation. Okay, so I think that, that kind of question here, um, which we have here, law on the heart, is that kind of the same thing here, the law written on the heart? I don't know, I think was, Chance who brought that up, this question in Romans 2? Or who was that? Oh, uh, Barry. Barry in the back. Well, he's not here. But anyways, it's a good question. I think it's an important one for us in this paragraph. Uh, because in chapter 3, Paul will show that nobody could have worked themselves to God anyways. Everybody needed the propitiation of the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Let's see where we are at. Okay. I think we'll get through chapter 2 here. So... Then the, the conditional statements that Paul will list here are all things the Jews had said about themselves, right? It was a, just common Jewish statements about themselves that as a whole, that the, the Jewish people were supposed to be guides. They were meant to be guides to the truth, that they carried the light of God in the law, and that that truth was meant to be a light to uh, the world. And they viewed themselves as instructors for the foolish, right? Because they were wise, so they saw themselves as the ones who would instruct the world on how to live, and that they were their teachers. But what Paul looks at this as is a bunch of conceited boasting, right? He says, you think you are guides to the blind, which is ironic because Jesus in the Gospels will call the Pharisees blind guides, right? the blind leading the blind in Matthew chapter 23. He confronts them, um, confronts the Pharisees and the scribes. Uh, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law embodiment of knowledge and truth. And what ends up happening is that they are just as much blasphemers of God as everybody else, simply because they are breaking the law. They are sinning um, against God. And there is nothing in and of themselves that makes them better. And so Paul, in this chapter, just tears the Jews down. Everything that they think that makes them somehow better or somehow more privileged or set apart is nothing. Even to the point of taking the most prestigious aspect of their faith and showing that it does mean nothing, right? That circumcision actually does not carry any significance unless it has done something to your heart. You think you are so great because you have this mark on your body. And even Jewish men thought of themselves as better than women because they could bear the mark of the covenant on their body. And Paul says, your circumcision is completely meaningless if it is not something that is done in your heart. And so he strips them of their pride by saying, hey, you see that Gentile over there? Yeah, that Gentile might be more of a Jew than you are simply because his heart is circumcised, while yours, you are only circumcised in flesh. And this is the key thing for Paul where he then has to get to the question of, well, if the, if, if the law doesn't matter, if circumcision doesn't matter, if all that we have as a people doesn't matter, then what advantage is the Jew? Right, what advantage is this ethnicity? And then we'll get into that tomorrow. So I think it's 12.30 now. I don't want to keep us too much longer, but I do want to to think about as we close today of our own exaltation, right? In which ways are we exalting ourselves amongst, uh, above others or considering ourselves more valuable or looking at ourselves as more important than others? And it's such a key takeaway from the book of Romans is that we would look at all people equally and we would see our need for Jesus as much as everybody else, right? It can be really easy uh, that when 
we are hurt, that somehow we think that we need more grace of God than the person who's hurt us. Or when we see somebody else do something wrong, that we hold them more to the expectancy of God's justice than when we do something wrong. And this is where the biggest, I think, picture of double standards in our lives comes out, is where we tend to think that we deserve more mercy and grace than somebody else who has done something of lesser wrong or equal wrong as we have done. And what we see with Paul is that everybody needs the grace of God the same. I'll pray for us, and we'll release for lunch. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. God, we thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you for this bad news, God, that will show us how good the good news is. Lord, we, we love you, Jesus. We're so grateful for the gift of salvation through you, the righteousness that has been revealed through the law, or through, through faith, God, that we don't have to follow the law, that we don't have to follow works in our lives that lead to salvation, God, but that we get to live in a place of obedience to you from the place of faith, Lord. We're so grateful for that truth. We love you so much, Lord. And I pray that you would bless this class today as I get into the book of Romans. In Jesus' name, amen.